You may be seated, if possible. Amen. Oh. Welcome to Revival. Tonight, is our 6,820th service. No, I'm sorry, that's not right. <laughs> that was prophetic. Uh, I don't know exactly the number, but we've been in church a long time. And we want to welcome you tonight. How many of you are here tonight? This is your first time to visit the revival. First time. 
Wow. Well, God bless you. We want to welcome you and just say, where have y'all been? God bless you. It's sure good to see you tonight. Uh, for the next few minutes, we're going to take time in the service that we, as we have done every Friday night since the beginning of revival to baptize believers that have accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And are following him in water baptism. And this is exciting. They'll give a short word of testimony, and then we'll baptize them in water. And when we're finished with that, we're going to come back and worship the Lord, praise the Lord some more. So keep your heart ready and just worship as they are baptized. As we begin the baptismal service, we have a special treat for you. A man and a woman coming together. They were saved just two weeks ago. They were married this afternoon by Randy Worrell in the chapel. And their first act tonight as believing husband and wife. Ladies and gentlemen, this is my wife, Linda. Three weeks ago, last Thursday, I was saved. A week ago, my wife here was also saved. The glorious thing about this is we came into sin and now we're going to wash it away forever. <laughs> Our body will be cleansed. We will be delivered to Jesus as one. All because of the revival that has become into my heart and hers. And I hope when it comes out, you will all come to this altar and become one with Jesus. What God has done for me is a miracle. I've been cleansed of cancer. He's healed. He's healed my shattered arm that the doctor said I couldn't use until December. He is wrong. He's not, he's the doctor, he's not the physician. He's not the physician. Because I was at the end of my rope. I truly was at the end of my rope and I had turned against God. And I had sinned and I lived in sin. Oh. So I let go of that rope. And I was caught in the loving arms of Jesus. He is my light. He is my salvation. I love Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Welcome to your confession of faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. We baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. On your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we baptize you now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. awesome. Uh, 
My name's Amy Lynn Ferguson, and I'm 21 years old. When I was five, about five or six, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior, but I didn't accept him as my Lord or my Father. Um, as I, as I uh, grew up in high school, you know, I was a closet Christian. I was raised in a very loving Christian family. My dad was a preacher's kid. I mean, I was a preacher's kid. <laughs> um, and, oh, my brother was a alcoholic and drug addict for most of his life, his teenage years, and, and I, I hated him. I hated him. I hated him. And as I, you know, and I judged him without looking at my own little life, you know, because I had sin. And I thought, well, it's just a little sin, you know, it's not major sin, you know. It's not the, like sin is sin. That's, I mean, sin is sin, man. And as I grew up, uh, I just got rebellious against God. I took advantage of his grace and his love. When I was about four years ago, my sister was diagnosed with bone cancer, my only and oldest sister. And uh, God gave us words that she was healed. You know, so we're okay, well, she's not gonna die because she's healed. But God took her on to heaven. And I got mad and angry and had all this confusion because God, I said, you know, you said she was healed. And, and my brother, he turned, you know, he turned to, to his drugs and his alcohol for, for the comfort. And I followed in his footsteps. I became what I hated. I became what I hated. And I, yeah, I tried to hang on to God. I tried to have that relationship at the same time, well, hanging on to the world. And he showed me, you know, I mean, it took me a long time to realize, you know, you can't have both. You can't have two masters. Um, I, you know, I, just, I look for my comfort in marijuana. I look for my comfort in the arms of other men. Thank God I, I still have my virginity. At least I was brought up with enough Christian background, you know, I didn't go all the way. And even that, you know, I, well, I'm not, I'm just going a little, you know, we're just heavy petting just a little, you know, we're just, it's not, you know, I'm not having sex, God. So, I mean, I was just so, so deceived. I was so deceived. I look back now, I don't even know who that person is. I don't even know who she is, man. She's like a stranger. Ooh. I came to this revival last February. And God, man, God was calling me, man. He was calling me for so long. And I, I confessed to my, my mom, who had no idea what was going on for like two years, almost, over a year. I was into drugs and just partying, you know, and just all these blinders on my eyes, all these veils in my eyes. I couldn't see the truth. And he was calling me the whole time. Jesus was praying, praying for me, weeping for me. Oh, oh God. Oh, um. Okay, so I came down here last February. And man, oh, he washed me. He washed me. Oh, oh. Were ripped off of my eyes as I ran to the altar. <laughs> the veils were ripped off, man. And I went back. To, oh, I love this song, man, because it's so true. I went back with God right before me, man, right on my side. And we took back my innocence. We took back my purity. I took back my joy. I took back my freedom. <laughs> I took back the victory, Lord. Oh, God, he's so good. Woo. Now, I'm in the Brownsville School of Ministry. And so it's my brother. He's totally set free, man. Woo. I'm, I'm going with God.
God all the way, man. He is my Lord. He is my Savior. He is my comfort. He is my healer. He is my God. He is my Father. He is my lover. Lord, I'm all yours, God. I'm all yours, Lord. My name is Elizabeth Harper, and I'm from Monahans, Texas. <laughs> and I came here in April, addicted to cocaine, crack cocaine, and acid, and, and smoking pot. And when I left, I was ready to get high. And now I've been delivered. God has set me free. <laughs> <laughs> Elizabeth, upon your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we baptize you now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hi, I just want to say, whoo! I am high with the Spirit. This is better than drugs. <laughs> I want to thank the Lord for Steve Hill for coming into my life. I have been down the road of drugs and seen the blackness of the darkest pits and didn't think I could ever come out. I've been saved a long time ago and I backslid and came back to drugs and I was a junkie for six years, maybe eight, ten, I don't remember. I just love Jesus. <laughs> and I got out of an abusive relationship about two weeks ago. And I asked him to leave Saturday night and Sunday morning to hit me. You've got to go to Brownsville. And I came and I said, Lord, I just want Steve to lay his hands on me and pray over me. And two weeks ago, he laid me out. And I praised God and I thank you, Jesus. <laughs> and when I saw him... It was told I needed to come back and renew my baptism. And uh, this is what I'm doing. I thank Lord. I thank the Lord. I thank the Father for his son, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. Hallelujah. Confession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. My name is Wendy Fisher, and I'm from Omaha, Nebraska, and I grew up in a Christian home, and I was one of those good kids who knew all the verses and everything like that, and I never drank or smoked or anything, but I was so lost because I didn't have Jesus. I believed in my own righteousness and my own goodness, and last April or March, my parents came to Brownsville, and I thought they were crazy because I didn't think you needed all this stuff, and... <laughs> and um, um, Pastor Carrie Robertson was praying for my mom, and he asked where her husband was, and my dad was right next, and then my brother and my sister, and he prayed for our family, and that night... <laughs> I was in Omaha, and the Lord showed himself to me, and I saw for the first time that I wasn't righteous at all, and that I was just evil in his sight, and I bowed my knee to him for the first time, and I said, Lord, take all of me, and I saw myself, and I saw my sin, and I'm just so thankful to him because he set me free from anger and hatred and bitterness and all kinds of things, lust, and keep 
set me free from everything. And now I'm in the school of ministry, and I just want to give him everything that I am. Wendy, upon your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we baptize you now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hi, my name is Sandra Walker. I haven't, I've been going here for a long time. I got saved two years ago. I started backsliding. I come back to the altar and got saved. Now I have Jesus as my Savior and my Lord, my Lord and I'm going to praise Him the rest of the days of my life. Hi, my name is Cassie. I haven't been coming here that long. I've been backsliding, and my friends brought me here. And all I gotta say is, I guess that's all. On your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we baptize you now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. How you doing? My name's Ernie Culver. I live in Pensacola, lived here for 45 years. I haven't known much of nothing but jails, courtrooms, prison, drugs, motorcycles. But I know now I know Jesus. I don't need to go back to that no more because Jesus set me free from all that. It's not peace anymore. It's victory. <laughs> Satan, you were defeated on the cross. You defeated it in my life because I gave it to Jesus. Thank you. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. My name is Darrell Lemon from Henderson, Kentucky. I came to this revival. I was saved and baptized years ago, but the power of God is so strong here tonight and all week that your sins can't stand up under the power of God anymore. And you'll bring them out, people. My problem was that I, I wanted to put myself ahead of God, you know, but God has to be first. He'll, the, our brother preached the other night, God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. That means that he's still a holy God. He still expects you to be holy. And when you turn away from him to do what you want to do in life, it hurts him. He's jealous. He won't put up with it. And I believe that the power of God that is in this revival is due to the wonderful prayers of the Christians here and the wonderful preaching of Steve. I tell you, his power is all searching. It'll search your whole. If you're here, with, if you've got religion here, you just 
need to turn your religion, throw it away, and, and seek God. He'll, he'll completely take over your life. He'll make everything right. You know, holiness is still in style, people. You know, I believe if God looked at some of our closets, he would find these stove top hats and polyester is all he could find. We're so, we're so far out of step with God and so far out of, out of the style. God's style, it, it's pathetic. I tell you, oh, hallelujah. The Lord is great. If you don't know him, if you don't know him, find him here in this revival. He'll, he'll make everything right. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Professor of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we baptize you now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. My name is Robert McKenzie. I'm from uh, Richmond, Virginia. And uh, I spent 31 years having drugs do me and 16 years on the street. And now I've got the presence of God in my life. And I've got a reason to live. <laughs> and I'd just like to thank the Lord for taking the time to love me and to come into my life. Amen. G'day, my name is Philip Grinley, I'm from Australia. Uh, and I'd just like to thank the Lord a lot for bringing me over here. I, I didn't come with the intention of getting water baptised. I've been involved with church for many years, but I decided it was time to give up religion and go for it with God. It, you, you know, like, like I used to get really fired up in revival meetings, but I, I know tonight's a night of change. I've had prophecies over my life for what? Um, I'm going to do and you know the Lord was really speaking to me when Steve Hill was speaking on Wednesday night if you will get real with me I'll get real with you and that's why those prophecies haven't come true tonight I'm coming home Lord hallelujah come on. fill up upon your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ we baptize you now in the name of the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit <laughs> Hi, everybody. <laughs> My name is Chris Tanner. I'm from Cleveland, Ohio. Lord has saved me, has taken me from a lot, and it's just beginning now, and I love it. I used to wrestle when I was in, in, in school, and I never won one match that I have ever wrestled. And now I just realized something. I've been wrestling a lot longer than that, and I finally won. <laughs> Satan, you just lost another one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> Thank you. Lord, according to your confession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Hi, my, my name's Mike Gelf. I'm from Michigan. Um, I'm with a group from the New Hope Home. Um, I've spent 34 years in sin. It's uh, taken me to prison, alcohol, drugs. 
uh, everything you can imagine. Um, the shame and guilt, the pride and everything that I held in myself. Um, I, it, it, I, couldn't, I didn't understand what, what was keeping me back from Jesus until I found out that he had died for all my sins before I, he knew all my sins before I'd even committed them. And it took me going to an altar and giving all those sins back and, and asking forgiveness for that. And today I can say I love Jesus. He's in my life. And from here on, I'm going to abide in his whatever he has for my life. Thank you. Mike, upon your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we baptize you now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, when I was five, um, I just felt hurt and rejected when my uh, father left and everything. And over the years and stuff, I just blamed God for everything. I, I just hated him. I, I, when I got older, I just wanted to kill myself. I just blamed him. I was just praying for him to kill me because I knew if I killed myself, I would go to hell. And then I went to uh, a psych hospital for depression and everything. And since God didn't kill me, I just said, well, I'm going to get back at the world. And I dealt drugs, crack cocaine, and just did evil things to try to get back at the world. And then I tried to hustle God, but I said, you know, God, I'll give you the drugs and stuff. If you just make me rich, I thought money could fill the void. And, uh, and I couldn't do it. And, I, and then uh, I started watching these videotapes of, of Brownsville and stuff. And he said, you know, the little stuff, you know, like smoking and R movies and all that, that's why I didn't feel any difference and stuff. And, I, and I, I thought, man, there's no way that God's going to send me to hell for that little stuff. And then God reminded me that Adam and Eve thought the same way, too. They thought, there's no way God's going to kill me and kick me out of the garden for this, just eating this little apple. And that's when I just said, man, I just need to get saved. And I just need to really know Jesus, really live for him, just love on him. And I'm just warning you guys, don't think the same way Adam and Eve did. Just love on Jesus. And Jesus, I just thank you right now for saving me and just, just loving on me. We baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, my name is Daryl Wayne Lee. I'm from Clinton, Mississippi. I have uh, lived a, a life full of sin. I've been in bondage to sin. And I became very much involved in alcohol and drugs and uh, was totally overcome by it. And I said a prayer in Dallas, Texas about sometime about a month before I, I got into the waterfront rescue mission and uh, that I would need, ask the Lord to lead me somewhere for help. I got in a car to go on a party and I wound up going by Pensacola and he, I literally got thrown out of the car. And... Uh, I got back in the car and went back and was going to try to make my way back, and I got thrown out of the car in Mobile, Alabama. And uh, I got instructions I had to go to the Waterfront Rescue Mission in Mobile, and then I wound up in Pensacola, back in Pensacola. And then I went to the New Hope home, and the Lord's Spirit has touched me. And I, 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 Jesus Christ, I love you, and I give it all to you right now, Lord. It, it, I'm yours. Thank you. upon your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We baptize you now in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Hi, my name is Eddie Garcia. I'm from Monahans, Texas. Uh, I want to thank the Lord first tonight for this revival. And I want to thank the Lord because I backslid, but now that one thing I know that when I came back to Christ was that he didn't let me down. I let him down. But one thing I know now is that I'm redeemed and sanctified. Pray. Thanks, Lord.
My name's uh, Ricky Haltom. I'm from uh, Shreveport, Louisiana. Uh, three months ago, uh, God led me to the New Hope home uh, in Gulf Breeze, Florida. Uh, had a problem with drugs. Uh, had a lot of other problems, too. Had a lot of unforgiveness, uh, a lot of bitterness, a lot of pride, uh, a lot of rebellion, you know, but uh, God's cleaned me up. Uh, you know, uh, also, you know, the doctors told me I was a uh, manic depressive, uh, bipolar. You know, I was taking 1,000 milligrams of uh, the Dival Prox, 100 milligrams of Zoloft, uh, and 200 milligrams of Trizodone to help me sleep at night. But none of it worked, you know. Uh, there ain't but one cure for sin, and that's Jesus Christ. And, uh, and he, he is, he is, you know, he is, he's really cleaned me up. And for the first time in my life, I have joy. I mean, those pills never worked. I took them, you know, and they made me feel good. But you know, not like the high I'm getting to hear from Jesus Christ. I, for the first time in my life, I have joy, you know, and, I, and I'm happy with it, you know. I have something that I was inspired to write last night. I just want to read it real quick. And it says, I have a father, one who lends his hand. When I think I can't, he says I can. He calls me a son, even though I'm grown. He takes pride in me and molds me to his own. I can trust him to guide me when I cannot see. His wisdom he delights in sharing with me. He cries when I let him down, but oh, how much more does his love abound. He doesn't hold my shame against me. He died to set me free. And no matter what I do, he's always standing there ready to receive. In return, he doesn't ask much of me, only that I approach him humbly on my knees. And it's there he hears my prayers and then delivers me. And though I have never seen him, in him I believe that he walked this earth long ago, that he died and rose again because he left his spirit as a gift to me. My father I have faith in wholeheartedly. His love never changes. He remains the same for all eternity. My father gave his life to pay the price for all humanity so that in him we might know he is truly the father of sacrifice. Ricky, upon your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we baptize you now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hello, my name is Milton White, and I'm a retina surgeon from Birmingham, Alabama, and I work with eyes that uh, end up being crushed and damaged and stabbed and shot. And I received Christ about 20 years ago, and uh, during the course of my training in medicine, I, uh, I, I didn't drift into alcohol or drugs or pride or, or anything like that, but that, that you don't have to do those things to be a sinner. You can have anger and bitterness and a lot of pride and uh, ambition and things like that can creep into your life and as you allow them to take a seed they can pull you away from the Lord and the word that I learned when I started coming to this revival several months ago was backslidden and I had slid away from the Lord and I'm here tonight to say that uh, I've confessed my sins and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior and his price for my sins would last for all eternity and I'm here to proclaim that in obedience to him would like to be baptized Thank you. Hi. <laughs> I, I love the Lord, but, but I had a problem with turning away. I'd get, I'd get hurt, and I'd turn away, and, 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 and I just kind of got brokenhearted, and I fell away from the Lord, and, 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 and I thank God for giving me this chance to come back because I... I <laughs> It's not me. I, I, I want to stand here. I could say things, but it's not me. It's, it's the Spirit, and, and I don't want to try to do it. I want to let him do it because, uh, if, you know, we try to do it on our own strength. It don't work out, and, and I've been there, and I've done that, and I don't want to do what he wants me to. I don't want to do that anymore. I just want to give him my life, 
and I want to do what he wants. <laughs> I need him so bad. <laughs> Profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We baptize you now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> My name is David Ashmore. I'm from Illinois. I was raised in a Christian home. I was baptized 25 years ago. When I went to Oral Roberts University, I got filled with the Holy Spirit. Shortly after that, I went into business for myself. I felt at the time the Lord put me there, and he did. But as, as the years went along and the money started coming in, I took the gift and I left the giver. About a year and a half ago, my wife and I, have, we have four children. Our oldest little girl went to be with the Lord from a disease. And that was the start of my old man dying. For 14 weeks, I never took more than a half a breath during my waking hours. My shoulders were starting to turn in as my body was dying. I found out that there was a revival down here at Brownsville. At the time, I didn't care but the Lord loved me enough to send me down here. It was a Saturday night, September 21st of 96. Lendl gave a prophecy, and in that he said, how long are you going to sin and try to take the sin out of your life and then turn around and do it again? Don't you know that if you'll give me your whole heart, I'll take that sin out of your life? I broke the rest of that service, and... I've heard the rest of the preaching that's gone on here the last hundred and some messages since then, but Steve, that night, I didn't hear anything you said. <laughs> I'm sorry, but the Holy Spirit dealt with me that night. I gave my heart back to Jesus. At that time, it was 100%. I had no other reason to live. During the prayer time, Brother Steve came over, and before his hand could touch my forehead, I started doing major carpet time. For an hour and a half, I laid there, and I couldn't move. And before I had fallen, I didn't even believe it was real. About 10.30, the lights started flickering, and two big guys carried me, dragged me out of this church and set me out on a curb outside. <laughs> to make a long story short, two days later, I flew home, and I was driving around in one of the subdivisions that I owned. And for the first time since I had gotten off that floor, it's that Saturday night, I realized that I hadn't grieved over my little girl going to be with Jesus. And it's been 53 weeks, and I haven't grieved for five seconds. And since, since that time, the Lord has taken a hold of my life. The deposit he's put in me is beyond my words. And I, too, pray the Spirit of God that's in me, in, within me, I will be known in hell, too. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus Christ, we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah to the Lord. Let the earth rejoice, let the earth rejoice, let the people be glad.
Fire goes before him and burns up all his enemies. The hills melt like a wax at the presence of the Lord. Declare his righteousness. The people, we see his glory. All the earth, over all the earth. The Lord reigns. The Lord reigns. Oh, yes, he reigns. Let the earth rejoice. Let the earth rejoice. A fire goes before him. Come on, sing. Burns up all his enemies. The hills smell like wax at the presence of the Lord. At the presence of the Lord.
Scott, where are you? Hallelujah! Scott's going to come and blow the shofar, and when he does, I want you to shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Hold that microphone for him. Come on, let's worship the Lord.
to your name, Jesus. <laughs> Bless the name.
Totally yours, totally yours, running after you as hard as I can. I'm running into your arms, Jesus. Ooh, go ahead, praise him. Tell him how you feel about him. Tell him how you feel about him. Talk to him like he's right here because he is. Jesus, you're everything to me. Everything I've ever wanted, everything I've ever hoped I could find is in you, Lord. life is in you, Lord. Everything I own, everything I have is yours, Lord. Oh, lover of my soul. building enter into the presence of the Lord has never done this in your life. Go ahead. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Here I am, Lord. Here I am, Lord. Here I am. Here I am. Here I am. Here I am. Take 
Take my life, take my heart, take everything, it's all yours. I was made to sing your praise, I was made to give you glory, so here I am, Lord. Everything we have is yours, Lord. Here we are, Lord. We present ourselves to you. Here we are, Lord. We're your people. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We fail sometimes, but we love you. We love you, Lord. Our heart is after you, Jesus. We're going after you as fast as we can, as much as we know, Lord. We're going after you because we want nothing more than to feel your presence, to feel your nearness, to know you're here. Oh, you make our hearts sing. You make joy spring out of our lives. Hey, oh, living water, living water, living water. Mm. Living water, living water. Living water. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Mm-hmm. Yes, 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 yes. It's okay. Lift your voice. Go ahead. We're in no hurry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Lift it.
Lamb of God. And many of you have come into this place tonight and you've said, Lord, I know you're moving and I know you're moving in the world. And you've said to the Lord, Lord, where are you in my life? Where are you in my life? It seems that everyone around me is receiving of your glory and I can't find you. And the Lord says that coming to this meeting was stepping out of the boat on your part because this is out of the boat for you. But the Spirit of the Lord says because you've stepped out of the boat and you've walked toward me, Lord Jesus says to you tonight that I'm running to you. I'm running to you. And what the Lord has began in your life tonight, he's going to continue. So prepare yourself and position yourself to go all the way with Jesus because the Lord is running after you. And if you give in to his spirit completely, you'll be amazed in coming weeks of what the Lord will do. And you'll be amazed at the boldness that suddenly has come upon you that has never been there before when you open your mouth to witness because you've always asked the question, Lord, why is it I don't have that? The Lord says, I'm giving that to you tonight but you have to follow through with it. When I give you the word to go towards someone and tell them about what I have done in your life, you're to run to them and you're to share with them what I'm doing. And the Lord says, I'll go before you and prepare their hearts and you'll be amazed. You will be amazed at how I'll use you because you've taken one step toward me and you've opened your spirit. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey! Woo! <laughs> oh, yeah! Oh, yeah! I am looking I am longing for a place where I can lay my head upon your breast. And I am looking for the place where you will pour your oil over me all over. Peace. 
Well, we welcome you to Friday Night Revival. There's nothing like Friday Night Revival. Hallelujah. <laughs> I'll tell you, if you don't get anything else during the week of revival from Wednesday through Thursday, Friday night's worth it all. Thank God. Thank God. People, they wonder, why, how in the world do you folks keep doing this? Well, uh, you know, there's some things you have to do, and there's some things you get to do. And uh, even in Christianity, it's that way. You know, you have to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior to be a Christian. You have to do that. You have to live without sin and be holy as the Lord's holy because without that you won't see God. You have to do that. But then God lets us do some things like raise our hand. Hallelujah. You don't have to raise your hand. But we get to do that, you see. And, and we don't have to be in some uh, mystical trance or we don't have to be worked up into some uh, ecstatic state in order to do that. We just get to do that. And then we get to clap our hands sometimes. We just clap our hands if we want to. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. We just get to do that. You don't, you don't have to do that to be saved, but you get to do it. And, and, and then, then God even lets us get to dance sometimes. 
Yeah, you don't, you don't have to do that to be saved, but you get to do that. And, uh, it, you know, it's those get-tos that really bless me. I mean, I, I don't have any problem with the have-tos, but the get-tos is what, where I really, really get blessed. When you meet the have-tos, the get-tos are fun. It, it's absolutely marvelous. And, and God's just in this place in such power and such glory. I'll tell you, to, to just witness the, the testimonies in the baptismal pool. Now, I know that every one of those testimonies was not theologically correct. I know Steve Hill didn't save anybody, although he was given credit, and Steve knows that. It's Jesus that saves. But you see, these folks just got saved. They just got saved, and they're going to learn about the Savior later. Right now, they just know somebody preached to them, somebody reached out, somebody touched them, and so they give the credit to them. But, you know, they'll learn. Just give them a little room. Just give them a little time. The wonderful thing about the cross is the ground is absolutely level at the foot of it. In that baptismal pool tonight, there were people baptized right off the street. And the sa in that same water, there was a, a medical doctor baptized. And in that same water was another person that's, uh, that's been a drug addict most of their life. In that same water, there was a builder from, from outside of Chicago, Illinois, that was baptized in that water. And, um, uh, and everybody in the same water, everybody's the same. The water didn't change. We didn't have one set of water for one group of people, another set for another pe group. You know, it was all the same. With the, 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 the ground is level at the foot of the cross. And that's where you and our, I are tonight. There's no big, big you and little me or big me and little you. We're just the children of God in here just worshiping God. And that's the glory of this revival, friend. That is the absolute glory of this thing. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And it isn't Assembly of God. It isn't Pentecostal. It isn't Baptist or Methodist or anything like that. It's just God coming down and blessing his people. Hallelujah. It's so good to be one in this place tonight. There's such a unity here, no telling what God's going to do. You may be seated. I'm going to take just a couple of moments, and uh, we're going to receive an offering. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Praise God. Now, we've got pe people in the overflow tonight, and uh, those of you in the overflows, I hope that you're not disappointed that you didn't get in here and you think that you're going to receive nothing because you didn't get in here. But I'm going to tell you, God's in this place. Tuesday night we had a prayer meeting here and every area of this building, all the grounds were prayed over and uh, God is on the premises. The other day I had a vendor come here. He wanted to sell us some things and he was a big guy. I've told this before. But just to illustrate the presence of God here on this property, this guy was a, a former professional wrestler. And um, we, were, we were walking down the sidewalk out here between this building and the chapel over there, and tears began to run down his cheeks. Big old guy about six foot six walking along beside me. I looked like a flea, you know, beside a boxcar. It was like that. And uh, <clears throat> he just spent tears began to run down his, his cheeks. And he said, what in the world is this? And I said, man, it's God. God's here. And he said, I feel something. And he has no earthly idea what that was, you know. But it was the presence of God. And it was outside on the sidewalk because God is just here. And so those of you in the overflows, you're going to be blessed. We had a lady that came back into the choir room one night. Uh, the only place she could get in was in the choir room. We have a, a large screen back there. And uh, she was disgusted because she didn't come in here. And one of our ushers, God bless our ushers, one of our ushers saw her, dis her distraction and, and the discomfort that she had because she wasn't in here. And he said to her, said, ma'am, said, God's going to meet you back here just like he would if you were in the main sanctuary. She didn't believe it. And she walked in there and sat down. The power of God and the glory of God came down the, in the choir room. When she left, she looked that usher up and she said, hey, this was the greatest service I've ever been in in my entire life. So we welcome those of you in the overflow. God bless you. You're not going to miss a thing. God's in there just like he's in here. In fact, you can see better than a lot of folks in here can see. So bless God for that. <laughs> well, we're going to receive an offering. Those of you in the overflow, get your hand on your wallet. Hallelujah. It's blessing time. It is blessing time, friend. It's what the Scripture says. It's more blessed to give than it is to receive. God loves a cheerful giver, and he'll even take money from a grouch. <laughs> Hallelujah.
Praise God. It's wonderful to be able to give. And uh, for over two years now, God has met the financial needs uh, of this, this meeting. And God has done it this week, and he's going to continue to do it. And the offering tonight is a unique offering in that the offering tonight is the only offering that goes to our evangelist. It goes to him at his request. You see, any time an evangelist comes to a church, he could get the offerings from the evangelistic services that he holds there. But our evangelist knew that the expenses of this meeting uh, were tremendous. Lights, security people, nurseries, uh, you name it. Uh, he knew that it was expensive for, uh, for the church to maintain a meeting for over two years like this. And so early on in the meeting, he spoke to our senior pastor, John Kilpatrick. And by the way, pastor's doing great. Talked to him a couple of times today. He's really upbeat. He's really doing good. <laughs> Hallelujah. Continue to pray for him. I'm looking in a couple of weeks. He told me, he said, I'm going to get dressed up when I can get in that wheelchair. And he said, I'm going to come to church. So a couple of weeks, he's going to be here. He's going to be here. We're believing God for that. He may not be able to stay the whole service, but he'll be here to say hello to you. In the meantime, we're trying to hook up some communication so he can hear us live and we can hear him live. And uh, so you pray about that. Pray for pastor. But anyway... Uh, Steve told our pastor, said, you know, the expenses for this thing is great, so you take the other offerings and give me Friday night. And so that's what we've been doing now for uh, many, many months. And so this offering tonight is unique in that this is the only offering that our evangelist gets the whole uh, week. And uh, this offering really does not go to him. It goes to his ministry. He does not get this money personally. He's not putting it in his personal pocket. It is in the ministry that he is the head of called Together in the Harvest. And this ministry is reaching around the world even as Steve is here. See, Steve Hill was a missionary evangelist when he came here on Father's Day 1995 for one missionary service. He came for the service that night. Pastor asked him to preach that morning. The power of God fell in this place uh, that Father's Day morning in 1995. I believe it was June the 18th. And Steve had to cancel all of his speaking engagements, and he's been here every service except one. He was away on a speaking engagement, and got for, his plane got forced down because of weather, and he had to miss, he's only missed one service during all of these services for over two years now. And <clears throat> hallelujah. And so he's made a commitment to this revival. That's what I'm saying. He, he, uh, he canceled his speaking engagements, but he did not cancel the ministry which God has called him to around the world. And I'm, I'm glad that he was willing to stay here with us because I, I just believe that God has touched Steve and Pastor and put their hearts together to lead this great revival. And uh, had he uh, just flitted around all over the world, and I'm not talk saying lightly uh, when I use the word flitted because Steve's very serious about what he does, but if he had just been in here and out, gone somewhere, in and out, in and out, the revival would not be what it is. But Steve has made a commitment to stay here and to be with us and to do what God's called him to do here, and God has blessed us to help him to do what God's called him to do in the world. And... Um, I'll guarantee you he could have raised more bucks, missions bucks, uh, had he been out in different places uh, in the, the, the months that he's been here. He probably could have raised more money than what has been given to, to the ministry here for, for missions, but he stayed here. And so we try to get, to, to get the best offering we can on Friday night so that uh, he can be at peace about being here and uh, the people that depend on him around the world for missionary support can be at peace knowing that uh, the money's going to be on the way to help them win uh, the, the lost around this world. Steve is planning uh, teen challenge centers in places you wouldn't believe. In one of the, <clears throat> uh, one of the, the uh, countries down in, I believe it's in uh, South America, Central America, he's placing the first teen challenge center inside of a prison. Can you believe that? Friend, think about this. Think about this. When those prisoners go through that Teen Challenge Center and they get out of there, they're going to come out and they're going to be on fire just like uh, Steve Hill was on fire when he came through Teen Challenge. And uh, he's doing that. He's, he's planting Teen Challenge in Colombia and Russia. 
And uh, his goal is, and what he would like to do in, through his ministry would be to, uh, to, to plant uh, teen challenges all over the world. Listen, friend, when I was in the Navy, I was in a drug rehabilitation uh, uh, center one time, not as a patient. I was there as a, um, as a chaplain in the Navy. And uh, I'm going to tell you, our cure rate was about 8%. That was our cure rate. But Teen Challenge has a, a cure rate for drug addicts that is absolutely out of this world. Everybody marvels at what Teen Challenge is able to do. And it's because it's a Christ-centered ministry. You know, it is isn't a bunch of steps, and there, I'm not criticizing uh, any program that has steps, but it's a one-step program. Give your life to Jesus, get on your face, stay in the book, and God will clean you up and deliver you. That's the program. And, and Steve's ministry is teaming with Don Wilkerson, who is the international director of the Teen Challenge ministry right now, and they're, they're planning, teen, planning teen, teen challenges all over the world. And so this offering tonight that goes to Together in the Harvest will go toward those kinds of ministries around the world. And so I want you to give a good offering tonight. Uh, you need to look inside yourself and say, Lord, I thank God that I don't have to go through a Teen Challenge Center. And because you've blessed me and because you pre preserved me from being hooked on drugs and wasting my life, I have the opportunity and I have some money that I can invest in those who are not as fortunate as I. And, and uh, not only that, but missionaries as well. And so tonight I want you to give, and I want you to give liberally. I want you to give out of a heart of thanksgiving and gratefulness to God that you have not had to go through some stuff some other people have had to go through. You ought, you ought to give because you don't live in some of the nations uh, where Steve works. I'm going to tell you, the, the poorest American lives better than most of the people, the, the regular people in a foreign country. Uh, we, we are absolutely blessed out of our minds, and we don't even know it. Some of you have never been out of the United States, and you don't know how people live. And uh, somebody has to take the gospel to them. People say all the time, well, why don't they help themselves? Well, they don't have what we have, and they don't know what we know. They haven't been as blessed as we've been blessed. And so it's up to us. God's invested things in us that we might invest in others. Scripture said something like this, freely you've received, so freely give. You say, no, I work for my money, preacher. If God didn't help you, friend, you couldn't earn a dime. You couldn't earn a dime. You're not a self-made man. You're not a success. If God took his hands off you, you couldn't tie your shoe, much less make any money. And so what we have is a result of God's blessing on our hearts and lives. And God expects us to be good stewards of that. And part of that stewardship is to give to those who cannot help themselves. And we have an avenue through which we can do that. You can't go to Argentina. You can't go to Central America. You can't go to Russia. But you can send somebody there. And uh, if we'll all put our money together, and if we'll all do our very best, there'll be enough to get this job done. And so I'm going to ask you tonight. I'm going to ask you tonight for a sizable gift. Some of you, you could give a, a gift that would absolutely boggle the minds of people if they knew what it was. But nobody needs to know, only God and you. You've been blessed. Maybe you came into some money, and you've paid your tithes in your local church, and we expect you to put your tithe in your local church, not in this offering. This is an offering, not tithe, okay? So don't rob money from your church that you're fed in, you're, you're taught, and you're blessed, and your pastor comes to visit you. Don't put that money in, your tithe money, in this offering. But we're going to receive an offering right now, and we need a substantial offering tonight. And so I want you to, if, if God's blessed you and you're looking for some place to put a sizable investment in the kingdom of God, would you consider doing it here? Just let God speak to your heart about that. I'm going to ask others of you that um, maybe you don't have a sizable amount of money and you couldn't do something like that, but you could give $100. Now, I know that that may shock some of you. I can't believe the audacity of you to stand here and ask us to give $100. We paid to get here. We're paying to stay here and so forth. Listen, friend, you'd spend $100 to go to Disney World in a heartbeat. Take your family down there, you'd spend several hundred dollars. And, you know, once you, you're there and you go through the rides and you eat the cotton candy, you ever notice about cotton candy, you put it in your mouth and it's gone? That's the way, that's the way Disney World is. But the thing you're going to receive here is not going to go away like cotton candy, friend. It's going to be here. It's going to be here for weeks and months and years. It'll be here when Jesus comes, what God's going to put in you. 
And so if you're willing to spend several hundred dollars to go down to Disney World, do you ever pick at them because you paid to travel down there and paid to get in the gate? Did you ever resent that? No, you didn't. And so don't, don't be resentful of what you give here. Just get your priorities straight. Look at your checkbook sometimes. See where your money goes, and $100 will seem insignificant. So I know there, there are those of you here, you can't give $100. I know that. And uh, we don't expect you to do it if you can't. We're just asking those of you that can to do it. And listen, God knows what you've got. I was in a meeting one time, and God spo- I was there to speak. And God spoke to me and said, give this church $1,000. I said, whoa, wait a minute. This, this thing came into me. He said, give this church $1,000. I said, Lord, I'm here to be the speaker. And they're supposed to give to me. You understand? I'm here to get a, to, to, to speak, and they are, are, you know, normally give you an honorarium. And I said, this thing is backwards, Lord. It's, you know, and you're saying give, to, and he said, give, give $1,000. And I said, I don't have $1,000. And he said, um, yeah, you do. And I said, no, I don't, Lord. And he said, I know how much money you got in your savings account. He said, is that yours or is it mine? And I said, well, I guess it's yours, Lord. And he said, okay, if I want to give $1,000 of what belongs to me, then what's that to you? That's what what the Lord spoke to me about. And you see, God knows how much you got stashed away, friend. (laughs) He knows that. You may be sitting here and say, I can't give $100. Listen, God knows. God knows. And um, so he's asking you to do that. And um, you're going to be blessed when you obey him. So we need a good offering tonight. We need, you, we need a large offering. This is the only offering Steve gets. And this does not go to him personally. It goes to his ministry. He gets a salary out of that ministry, and that's all he has to live on. Brethren, would you come, please? Now, before you write a check or you reach in your pocket, I want you to listen to the voice of God. I want everybody to close your eyes right now. Shut yourself in. And I I want you to honestly ask God, would you just honestly ask God, Lord, what would you have me do? What would you have me do? What do you want me to do in this offering, Lord? Ask him that. I challenge you to ask him that. And then listen to him and then, then commit yourself to do exactly what he tells you to do. Father, I thank you right now because you're speaking to hearts in this room. And Lord, the money that's needed... For together in the harvest ministry is in this room. The money that's needed this week to pay their bills, it's in this room right now. And I'm asking you, Lord, for a spirit of generosity to come over the hearts and lives of the people that are here. And I'm asking you, Lord, that you let faith arise in their heart for the people to release what you're speaking in their hearts right now. Give them faith to release it to you. And, Lord, let them know that they cannot give you. And when they release it to you, that becomes seed which you can bless. And you can return to them some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. And, Lord, we're not going to tell anybody here that if they give $100, you'll give them 1,000 or 10,000. That's not what it's about. It's about obedience. And when we obey, the blessings of God come. The blessing may come in the, the fact that the car would go an extra 50,000 miles when otherwise it might break down. Lord, we're just asking you tonight to speak to hearts and let faith arise. Faith, Lord, that you are the sustainer and keeper and supplier of our lives. It is to you we look for everything we have and everything we are. It is you that gives us the power to get wealth. And so, Lord, release some of that wealth. Release it, Lord. You know what uh, the Together in the Harvest Ministry's needs are this week. God, don't let those needs go unmet. Don't let them go unmet in any area whatsoever, Lord. There may be souls that could be saved next week, next month, through people putting $100, $500, $1,000 in this offering, Lord. You've already, you've already uh, decided the place and the person that will preach the message as soon as they have the money to go. So, Lord, release it now, and we thank you for it, and we bless you, Lord, for what you're doing right now as your people are blessed through their giving. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.
One thing you may have noticed in the baptismal testimonies tonight was that there was not a tremendous amount of theological terminology. You didn't hear people who've been on the street for years get up and say, I just want to thank the Almighty who in his providence sent his provenient grace to prepare my heart that I might take advantage of the vicarious sacrifice of the eternal Son of God on my behalf. And you say, you know, I, yeah, I kind of noticed they would say things like, man, this is the greatest tie I've ever had. And, and this is better than any drug I've ever done. We had a woman baptized here one night sometime last year, and Steve told me about the testimony. It was the night before I was here, and she said, you know, I, she'd lived a wicked, sinful life, and she said, you know, living for Jesus, being filled with the Spirit, it's better than sex. <laughs> you hear people, oh, I'm so sad. Well, I heard that testimony. I only have one question. Do you disagree? <laughs> Listen, people delivered from drugs. I used to be a heavy drug user, late 60s, early 70s, for a few years before God saved me. No, I didn't say, well, I'll serve you, Lord, if you keep me higher than any drug. But I'll tell you something. When God touched me with his joy, I compared it to every other, quote, joy or good experience or good feeling I ever had in my life. And I said, the others are counterfeit. This is real. And I'll never put a needle in my arm again. And I'm done. You say, well, well they, don't, they don't get all emotional like that in my church. Well, I wonder if they're getting saved from sin like that in your church. You know, if, if you went into the temple when the lame man was healed, born, lame, 40 years, crippled, think of it, never walked, I don't think it would be a matter of, oh, I understand someone in the crowd was healed. Who, who was it? Could you point it out? Could you point him out to me? What happened 15 minutes ago? Yeah. Oh, he's, he's over there. Oh, let's go over and talk to him. How are you doing, sir? Really, um, very well today. Um, what, what happened on a scale of 1 to 10, at least a 4 or 5? It was profound, to say the least. Somewhat exhilarating. I don't think so. I don't think you'd have a problem finding the guy. Who got healed? You mean the guy jumping and leaping in the temple? The guy with a big grin on his face? That's the way it's described. He went to the temple walking and leaping and praising God. You know, how does the father in the, the account of the prodigal son respond? He sees his son a ways off and, hey, well, you know, I knew he'd be come back one of these days. <laughs> Hope he's learned his lesson, that boy. No, he sees him from a distance. He runs, he hugs him, he embraces him. In fact, John Kilpatrick got so excited talking about that story, our pastor. One night he, he said that the father said, I guess it was a Sunday morning, he was preaching on this, but he got so excited telling the story. He said that that Jewish father, of course, he forgot for a split second it was a Jewish father. He said, well, that father said, get the fatted hog, we'll have a feast. But the father was excited, you know. He ran. There's his son. And they had a party with dancing and celebrating. You don't know about all this shouting. Let me tell you something. You might have been one of those that didn't know about all the shouting and didn't know about all the emotion. And you may have been standing there in Leviticus, the ninth chapter, after Aaron and Moses blessed the people and offered up the sacrifices. But when the fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed the sacrifices, you would have been just like the other Israelites, shouting for joy and falling face down. Like 1 Kings 18, when the fire falls from heaven in answer to Elijah's prayer, what do the people do? They cry out and they fall prostrate. See, when God comes down, it's not a matter of, well, I'm not really that type of person. It's generally a lack of a fresh encounter with God. That's the issue. 
One time ministering over in Finland, I was struck by how conservative these dear Christians were, fine believers, but so conservative it seemed. And not everybody has to jump and shout and run around the building all the time. Pastor Carrie Robertson was nice enough to say, you don't have to shout, you don't have to raise your hands, you don't have to dance, but of course God does command us to. <laughs> and and I, I asked, you know, I said, why is it, you know, the, these hymns that these folks are singing, it, everything just seems so dead. And I love to sing some of the great classic hymns. And my translator said, you know, they, they actually have great joy as they sing those hymns. Even though it sounds very melancholy, I, I looked around and I said, man, I've seen more joy in a funeral than this. He looked around and he said, you know what, you're kind of right. And we started to talk a little bit more and, and I got up one night and I, I said to the people, now I understand why you don't respond with much emotion and praise and worship and prayer and I understand. I said, because you're very conservative people. So when Finland is playing Sweden for the gold medal in hockey in the Olympics, and with 10 seconds to go in a tie of a hard-fought match, the Finnish superstar breaks away, puts an incredible move on the goalie, and scores. And Finland wins the gold medal because you're very conservative. You say to your friend, what an example of dexterity and stick handling skill. <laughs> oh, cheers for him. I didn't know he had it in him. No, that's not what happens. Grown men jump up and down. They hug each other. Strangers hug each other, laughing, crying, because some guy hit a hockey puck, a piece of rubber, behind another guy with a mask. They jump and scream. But they come to church. Oh, holy, you're holy, holy. There's a time for falling silent, total reverence before God. But man, when God's touched your heart and life, he's more real than a hockey puck. Salvation's more wonderful than a gold medal. Get real, friends. I, I just want to let you hear a story here, just so that you know some of the reason that we jump and shout and celebrate. Now, bear in mind, a lot of the people that were baptized a year ago are in our school of ministry today. We, we saw them when they came in, got saved. In fact, we've got a bunch of students in the school of ministry that are here in the service tonight. A lot of them are out evangelizing. Others may be doing other things. But I want every student in our school of ministry who was either saved through the revival or transformed through the revival, stand to your feet throughout this place. All through the balcony. Hallelujah. Amen. See, we get excited because we see the beginning of the story and the middle of the story, and God willing, one day we'll stand before God and see the end of the story. But I, I want to read you a, something from the newspaper. This happened a few weeks ago. I'm going to give you part A, part B, and part C. It's part A. Man survives being run over by train. Did you hear that? Man survives being run over by train. Pensacola police have identified the man who was run over by a train near the Pensacola Civic Center late Saturday night, it's a few weeks ago, as Michael Stephen Gelf, 34 of Pensacola. He was apparently either asleep or he passed out between the rails and had to be pried out from under the CSX freight train, was treated at Baptist Hospital for minor abrasions on his arms and legs and was released, only run over by a freight train. We got here right after the train stopped, said Ron Whitcomb, 28, a nearby resident who witnessed the incident. I just saw him lying on the tracks. The train tried to stop, but it went over him. Now, Steve shared this testimony just to share. This is before he knew Part B. And then he said we would get to see Part C. According to the police reports, Conductor Henry Foster spotted him in the middle of the tracks as the train approached the 9th Avenue East Wright Street crossing at about 10.15 p.m. Foster applied the emergency brake immediately, and the train came to a complete stop, but not before five cars of the train had passed over Gelf. Foster observed that Gelf was unconscious. It took police about 40 minutes to pry him from between the rails of the train tracks. They hooked him to a board and slid him down a little bit to get him out from underneath. 
said Pastor Boy George Carl, 56, of Gulf Breeze. The unusual incident attracted many spectators and blocked traffic for nearly two hours. It sounded as if the train had derailed, someone had said. Because he was wedged between the rails of the tracks, Gelf escaped fatal injury. But police, but police said if Gelf had lifted his head a few inches, maybe he had passed out, maybe laying there unconscious, and he hears a train coming and lifts his head, that's it. If he had lifted his head a few inches, he might not have survived. Now, that was part A. He was taken to Baptist Hospital. Part B, and we got the report the night that Steve shared this, part B was, wasn't long after being in Baptist Hospital that he ended up in a place called New Hope Homes. <laughs> Hallelujah. This is a wonderful center, drug rehab, people that have been messed up, jail, lost in every kind of sin, end up in this place where they hear the gospel, where they're taught holy living and discipline by people who care about them, their lives are turned around. And if you go to New Hope Homes, one of the things you do is you come to the Brownsville Revival. Yeah. Hallelujah. It's our privilege to work with these people. And where are the folks from New Hope Homes? Would you stand up? Stand up and wave at them. Yes! God bless you. Part A, here's the newspaper report. Part B, he ends up in New Hope Homes. Part C, he was baptized tonight in water. Yes! Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Wave at us, brother. Wave at him. Hallelujah! Yes! Jesus! I said that to say we have something to shout about. Amen? Yeah. Yes, Lord! Steve forgot saying it, but I remembered when he did. When he read this and heard he was at New Hope Home, he said it won't be long before we see him baptized there. God bless you, man. God's got his hand on you for a purpose, I'd say. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Let me remind you on the way out to grab a brochure about the School of Ministry. And to be here 11 o'clock tomorrow, we're going to open up some of the teaching of Jesus from the parable of the sower that will be life-changing for you. So every one of you, this is not in particular for leaders, it's for if you're a leader, by all means be here. But every one of you, you have our invitation to be here 11 o'clock. We'll get into the word tomorrow. God will open our hearts. God will change many lives. God bless you. Keep worshiping him. Let's stand together. Normally about this time, I'll have Lyndall sing either We Will Ride or Spirit of the Sovereign Lord. But there's some joy in this place. Friend, you'd have to be in pitiful shape not to be affected by what's happened already in this service. And if you still haven't been affected, God's got some good news for you. There's some good stuff going to happen. But there are some people that have been so transformed in this revival. How many listen to the baptisms? When I listen to those, I cry. I feel it. I feel, see, I was a drug addict, but I also feel the folks that weren't drug addicts that were depressed, going through things. I feel every life. And then I look at them now, and they're so excited. They're so thrilled. And I've asked Lyndall right now, this is, this is, not, this is not par for the course, but we're going to do it anyway. There's a song that's been written called The Happy Song. And uh, when I first heard the title, I thought, that is a dumb title. But after singing it a few times, I thought, that is a perfect title for that song. Get excited about the Lord tonight, friend.
tell of all you've done Of how you changed my life and wiped away the past I want to shout it out forever of Topsy Oh, now I know that God is for me, not against me You changed my life and wiped away the past. I want to shout it out. See her face, see a smile over us. Unseen angels celebrate. Join in this play. So <laughs> for those of you that, that wanted hymns, you should have been here last night. We sang hymns last night. See, that's every single night is different at this revival. Every night. But you know what I love to see? Because this is just a mixture of music. This man is a classic at, at, at <laughs> ministering to the body. I love you, man. But uh, every, every night is different. But uh, what I love to see is we have so many of the, uh, of the senior saints to come to this revival. That's right. And I'll see Grandma out there with the happy song. She'll be going. 
you know? And then, then she'll be singing, oh, hell the power. She loves them all, you know? That's right. Get out of that mold, friend, and just enjoy what God's doing in these last days. See, there's a lot of people. <laughs> Glory. There's a lot of people getting saved in this revival. They don't know songs. They don't, they don't know the old songs. So they're learning them all. But this is the music right here. They're being born into this revival with this music. Every revival in church history has had its own music. And that's what this has. And we incorporate. They learn the hymns. They learn the older choruses of the church. But enjoy what God is doing, friend. Just enjoy. Don't stand there with a smug look on your face. You know, not, I don't like this song. You should have a screen up there with the words on. Just go, blah, 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 blah. Just, just enter in. I want everyone to stand. Those of you in the overflow, please stand. Those of you at home, stand to your feet. We're going to pray the prayer we've been praying since Father's Day. In just a few minutes, Charity is going to sing Mercy Seat. Those of you that are away from God, those of you that have sin in your life, and if there's ever been a night that you will understand the message, it's going to be tonight. It's going to be clear to the point. But I want everyone to pray the same prayer we've been praying since Father's Day. We've been asking the Lord to speak to our hearts and to change our lives. Those of you that are steeped in Christianity, you've been in Christianity a long time, you've learned a lot, you know a lot, you need changing just like everybody else. Okay? If your shadow is not healing the sick, you probably got a ways to go, okay? It's one of the things I loved about Leonard Ravenhill at 86 years of age before he died. I used to spend hours every week with him. We lived with we one of his neighbors and, and spent a lot of time with the man of God for three years. He was always going after God, always getting new revelation, spending six or seven hours a day with the Lord, always coming up to me with something new from Jesus, you know? He would, he would call me up and say, Stevie, get over here quick. God spoke to me about something. And I'd come over to his study and we'd sit down. He'd talk to me what God spoke to him about. You know, at 86, you seem like you'd, you know, retire from all that kind of stuff. No, friend. You're always growing into the likeness of Christ, becoming like Christ. Everyone pray this prayer with me right now. Everyone out loud. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus speak, to my heart. speak to my heart. Change my life. Change my life. In your precious name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I'd like to say one more word about the Waterfront Mission and New Hope Home. We thank God that you are here. We thank God for your ministry. And I know, I know the devil hates you. You're known in hell. When the word Waterfront Rescue Mission is sounded, the devil can't stand. He knows you're all about Jesus. When the devil tried to kill Mike under that railroad track, the Lord already had a plan. Already had a plan. The Lord is going, you're going to New Hope home, boy. Already had a plan. The devil was at that track going, I'm going to kill you tonight, son. I'm going to kill you tonight. There's angels all over you, man. I guarantee you there's an angel pressing your head down in the track. <laughs> yeah, praise God I heard that. Thank you, Jesus. Aren't you glad you didn't look up to see what was going on? <laughs> Sometimes it's good just to be still. What, what a testimony, man. What's your testimony, you know? That sounds, that sounds like a testifony. It sounds so strange, you know? <laughs> right before I got saved, you know, five boxcars ran over me. I'm glad I'm here tonight. Yeah. You glad you're here tonight? Yeah. Yes, Lord. Yeah. Talked to a pastor who worked for seven or eight years with Dave Wilkerson at Times Square Church, Bob Phillips, one of the finest teachers in America. We talked for about a half hour today, and Bob said to me, he said, Steve, 
When that broke out at Brownsville, I knew it was God. This is a scholar, a scholar. Many of you know who he is. And he said, I can't wait to get there. He said, I can't wait to come down. He said, I'm coming down Halloween week. And I thought, that's a good week to come down, Halloween week. That's a good week to come down to the revival. Friend, you're in the right place. This is God. He's going to touch your life. We don't have a handle on him. No one's ever had a handle on God. And no one's ever had God in a box. You heard people say, you've got God in a box. God, you're in a box. God's never been in a box. Okay? God's never been in a box, friend. So he's free to move in this place. That's why every service is different. He can do what he wants to do and when he wants to do it. Turn with me to Luke 23 tonight. Some of you are looking at your watches going, dear God, look at the time, and they're just now opening the Word. It's called revival, friend, and time really doesn't matter. When 2020 and Time Magazine and all these guys have come and go out of this place all the time, it became so common to have these folks here. They're just always coming through, pouring through this place, and... Uh, and, and filming and writing articles. And one of the things they cannot believe is the length of the services. And they would, uh, the Washington Post stayed one night till like 1.30 in the morning, okay? I was gone. I already left. But they stayed till like 1.30 and uh, just to watch because there's still like 1,500 to 2,000 people on the campus at 1.30 in the morning. And he just wanted to see how this whole thing ends, if it does, you know. So he stuck around, you know. And, and so he was writing. You know, this guy doesn't know the Lord. He's just writing this story as he sees it. And he said, he said around 1 o'clock, they began picking up the slain in the Lord Okay? You know, that's how they saw it, you know? And so they, they would pick up the slain in the Lord and carry them outside and lay them gently in the cool grass. <laughs> Only for them to wake up under the stars and, you know, the, the moonlit night and, and wander off to their cars. One night, uh, a man was hit by the power of God and was carried out of this place and, and laid out there, and they couldn't move him. He was a big guy. They couldn't move him out in the parking lot, just wasted out there, just God blessing his socks off. So the, the guards didn't know what to do. The ushers couldn't budge him, so they took these cones, and they... <laughs> they put all, all around his body, you know, like a, like a murder scene or something, you know? And people would drive by, just drive around the... The codes. <laughs> You're laughing. That might be you tonight. <laughs> yeah. We're a full service church, friend. We'll take care of you. <laughs> Ain't nobody going to run you over. We'll take care of you. Now, once you hit the highway, you're on your own. We had the cops pull over somebody down the road one night, and, and uh, they were swerving. Pulled him over and uh, put the breathalyzer in his mouth and uh, uh, nothing, you know. And the cop goes, Brownsville. <laughs> it's the presence of the Lord. People are being blessed, friend. People are being blessed. Their lives are changing. The sin's leaving their lives. That's wonderful. Luke 23. I just don't like all those manifestations. Well, fooey on you. Just be a prune. You know? Some of you would rather see a young person shaking on drugs. You would rather see a kid shaking on drugs than shaking under the power of God. That would make you happier to know that that was an addict shaking under the devil's power and the drug addiction. It was going to die in that. You'd like that. You can handle that, but God shakes up a young person, all the sin leaves, and they go into the Bible school. You can't handle that. Something's wrong, friend. Something's wrong. I don't know about you, I'll take the shaking under the power any day. I would love. And you think, well, they can't shake all the they don't shake all the time. They have they go to they, they go to school, they study, they work. They evangelize, but when the power of God comes down, friend, they're free. God gets a hold of them. Man, I'm going to stop while I'm ahead. Some of you in this place, 
Did you know that we're about two and a half months from Christmas? You said at the beginning of 1997 you were going to get right with God. You've already used up 276 days. There's only 89 left, and you're still not right with God. You're going to blow 1997 just like you blew 1996 and 1995 and 1994, and you know exactly who I'm talking about. You're going to blow another year, another wasted year. Thanksgiving's going to come around, and you're going to still be cussing. Christmas is going to come around, and you're going to still be the Scrooge. Why? Because you don't know God. Ain't got nothing to be thankful for. You're a pain to be around. When are you going to get right with God, friend? You only got 809 days till the year 2000. You going to wait till then? I doubt it. You're a procrastinator. Just keep putting it off, putting it off, putting it off. I want to tell you, there's an event that's going to happen that ain't going to be put off. It's called, it's called the rapture. It's going to be on time. It's going to be like that in the twinkling of an eye. The twinkling of an eye. It could happen tonight. It's going to be over. And every procrastinator in this room is going to have a heart attack because they're going to know what took place. They're not going to believe, man. I waited and I waited and I waited. I was going to get right around Christmas time. I was going to wait for an Easter cantata. I was going to do this. I was going to wait till I was 19 and out of high school. I was going to get right with God. Friend, get right in just a few minutes. Luke 23. This is an unusual scripture for me to use for my text tonight, but bear with me and you'll understand it. Luke 23, verse 39. These are the thieves on the cross. One of the criminals, those of you that don't have any clue what I'm talking about, when Jesus was crucified, he was crucified like a criminal. There was two thieves, one on the left and one on the right being hung with him. And Matthew, I believe it was, was it Matthew, Mike, that, that Matthew talked about these two thieves. Look this way before we read the scripture. Matthew talked about these two thieves hanging next to Jesus. They were hurling abuses at Jesus. That means they were mocking him and jeering at him like everybody else. Not only was Jesus being attacked from the ground, he was being attacked from both sides. He had already been beaten bloody. His back had already been raped with a plow. Bones and, and glass tied to, tied to leather strips were raked across his back. His back was ribbons. His face was torn to shreds. His blood had dried all over his eyes from the thorns that had been plucked in, uh, put, pushed in his forehead. He'd already been spat upon. His beard had been plucked. He'd already been totally wiped out. His hands were pierced. His legs were pierced. And now he was put in the hole, hanging on top of Mount Calvary, most theologians believe, totally naked on the cross, totally naked for everyone to gawk at. So at every embarrassing moment you've ever gone through, friend, Jesus has gone through more. Totally naked on the cross. And here's thieves on the right and the left mocking him you would think that they would be mocking themselves or mocking the crowd but not mocking the man hanging in the middle but they were now I don't know who was at the cruci crucifixion I don't know when Luke showed up in the picture what he knew about Jesus before I don't know the whole story about Luke but somehow he got the picture someone told him what happened Luke records this, that the two thieves, of course, were mocking. Matthew talked about that. But he said one of the thieves turned to Jesus and began to speak to him, had a change of heart. Now, what I believe happened, I've shared this the other night. I believe when Jesus said, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do, I believe the thief heard that and began to melt on the cross. And that's when he turned to his the, the other man, I don't know if it's a friend or just another man hanging on the cross, and said to him, we are not deserving. I mean, he is not deserving of what's happening to him. We are. And he turned to Jesus and he said this, Jesus, remember me when you get into your kingdom. And Jesus, rather than looking at him and cursing him to hell for the words that had just previously flowed from his mouth, he said, today you'll be with me in paradise. That is an awesome scripture, friend. But look... At verse 41, 
Look at 40. But the other answered and rebuking him said this, Do you not even fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? Verse 41, And we indeed, indeed justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Now where did he get that, Mike? Where did that thief learn about that? Who told him that Jesus had done nothing wrong? Who told him? Where did that conviction come from? Was it just the words from the cross? I don't know. Maybe his daughter had been saved in one of the Lord's meetings and told him about Jesus. Maybe he had heard all about Jesus, but somewhere came this statement, this man has done nothing wrong. My message tonight is entitled, there's a fan blowing over here. Could you turn that, Richard? How many like that fan blowing on you? Five dollars, we'll blow it this way. <laughs> One night in the revival service, we were worshiping God, and it was so hot in this place. Man, we hadn't had no fans out here. People were worshiping God, and, you know, everybody's looking for some type of visitation from God. You know, everybody wants to be, see angels or, you know, have a powerful, and I do too. Every night, man, I'm going, God, more. You know, I want to see what Peter and those guys saw. And they hung out with angels, you know. Did you hear me? They hung out with those guys. Awesome. And so one night it was just, just hot as fire in this place. We were all worshiping God. And, and uh, so they brought these fans out and pulled one of them down here. And it, they blew it out towards the audience. But, of course, everybody's out here going like this. And you, and you heard people go, oh. <laughs> oh. You know. It's a $79 fan, friend. Sorry. <laughs> Just, they thought it was a spirit. You know. Whatever you do, don't try to see a vision or anything tonight. Don't look at the lights and go, you know, stare at them and close them and see blue dots and go, <gasps> angelic blue eyes. <laughs> if it's real, it's real. If it's not, it's not, okay? Don't fake anything. God's here in power, friend. This is entitled The Standard. The standard. And I take it from this scripture, but this man has done nothing wrong. Now, what is a standard? The Lord gave me this this morning, friend, and you're going to listen to it. This is from Jesus. A standard is that which is established by sovereign power as a rule or measure by which others are to be adjusted. Those of you trying to take notes, forget that. You're just not, I'm not going to repeat it. I will, one more time. A standard is that which is established by sovereign power as a rule or measure by which others are to be adjusted. For example, what time is it? Everyone look at their watch. Nine, I've got around 9.38. 938, give or minus, bless or take. Uh, uh, some of you haven't changed your watches from Norway. This is what time it is here, okay? <laughs> They're going, hey, that man at. But how do you know? I mean, we walk up to some of you going, it's 938. How do you know? Who told you it was 938? My, 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 my Timex. Well, how does your Timex know it's 938? I said it. With what? Who told you I called the radio and they gave me the time? How did the radio know what time it was? This is a standard. There is a standard and it's indisputable. No one disputes it. It's called a Greenwich time and it's in England. And I've been over there, friend. Someone turned to me and said, look over there. And I went, what's that? They said, that's the place. I said, what? That's it. That's Greenwich time. That's where it all happens right there. That's where every, time, every clock is set all around the world by that place right up on that hill. I went, wow, that's cool to be so close. So I set my watch. You know? <laughs> That is a standard. And before launching out into tonight's message, I want to first establish the fact, whether you like it or not, our lives are governed by standards. Yes. Listen to me, friend. In 1902, how many have ever seen a speed limit sign on the side of the road? Where did that come from? Who said 55? 
Who said 35? Who said 25? Who said 15 at school zones? Who said, where did that come from? Those are standards. It started back in 1902. The government decided we will have speed limits. That was back when the cars were starting to roll faster. You know, there was a time they went five or 10. That was it, you know? And they could barely keep up with the horses, but then they started going faster and running over horses. So they said, we need to have a speed limit. So in 1902, the standards were set. In 1883, because everybody going berserk about the time, they set the standard time, the Greenwich time. And that is what everyone uses all over the world. Some of you may be familiar with the new clocks that are out. I've got a little sheet. I got a catalog in the other day. And this is a clock. That's, it's called the Zate Wall Clock, and it's set up by the NIST Atomic Clock in Fort Collins, Colorado. You buy this clock, it costs about $69 now, no, $99. Don't buy it yet, friend. It'll be $29.95 at Walmart in about six months. <laughs> but this is one cool clock. You want to know why? It only loses like one billionth of a second every million years. That's close enough. You'll be on time. No more excuses, Bubba. <laughs> but this clock is set up with a satellite. And the satellite is set up with the standard time around the world. When you buy this thing, it doesn't come with batteries. You buy it, you put the batteries in, and the clock goes wild. It starts going zzz, 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 zzz. All the hands go which way? And it finally goes zzz. And it's time. You don't ever have to mess with it, friend. Every time you look at the clock, it's in tune with the satellite. The satellite's in tune with England, and it's going to tell you exactly what time it is. It's a standard clock. Is anyone listening tonight? You need to pay attention to this, friend, because we're going somewhere. America, all the students, how many of you have taken SAT uh, tests and ACT tests? Most of us have. You know what those are? Those are standard measurements of your stupidity. They want to know how... S <laughs> they want to know how smart you are. Those are scholastic aptitude tests, and they are standards. People will come up and say, what you make on her ACT score? That's what they want to know. And when you tell them, they go, she can't come to our school. Why? It is a standard. Is anyone listening tonight? The Occupational Safety and Health Administration has set standards of operation. Those of you that work in factories, you'll see signs that say you can do this and you can't do that. Do this, can't do that. Why? They are standards that have been set from higher powers. That's just the way it is. And if you don't put your belt on, if you don't wear that harness that helps you when you're working and, and you hurt your back, you blew it because the standard says you've got to wear that back belt. You're supposed to wear it. And if you're not wearing it and you want to sue the company, you're going to lose the case because you didn't have the belt on because the government said you had to put the belt on at 8 a.m. It's a standard. Is anyone paying attention? <sighs> Underwriters Laboratories, you see new L. You will see that on products. They are the world's largest independent testing lab. If you come up with a product, maybe you come up with an automatic Bible opener, okay? And you, you'll call them up and you'll say, man, I've got an automatic Bible opener. They'll go, is it good? You'll say, I think it's pretty good. They'll say, send it to us. And you'll send it to them. And they'll test your automatic Bible opener, friend. They'll take it and they'll drop it five feet to the ground. And if it breaks, they'll let you know your automatic Bible opener cannot last, a, cannot stand a five-foot fall. You go, well, I'll check that. I'll make it a rubber. I'll make a rubber one. So you make a rubber one. You send it back up there. They'll put it on, they'll put it on automatic and see how long your Bible opener can open the Bible. And they'll call you back and they'll say, it cannot work for more than 24 hours in a row. It fizzled out and burned up. They test everything. They'll take anything you make and they'll kick it. They'll throw it. They'll run over it with a bulldozer. They'll do anything to test it. And then they'll set a standard. They'll say, this is good. This is bad. Good, bad. That's why a lot of products never make it to the market. They made it to the underwriter's laboratory first. Paying attention? How many have ever used a ruler? How do you know that's correct? <laughs> Who said that that's an inch? <laughs> the ruler said it's an inch. Who told the ruler? 
Somebody down the road, friend, decided they're going to make a set standard of length. There was a time where they used a cubit, which was a length from the elbow to the tip of the middle finger. That was a cubit. Well, that didn't last very long, friend. Everybody's elbow <laughs> and middle finger were different lengths. About a cubit is, I want his cubit. I don't want your cubit. I want his cubit. So that didn't work. So then they came up in Great Britain, listen to this. They come up with the linear measurements of the inch, the foot, the yard, and the mile. I want you to pay attention because we're going somewhere, friend. They have a distance. And it's called a yard. It's called the Imperial Standard Yard. Say that with me. The Imperial Standard Yard. It is a yard. It is made of bronze. It was, it's a bronze bar that was made back in 1845. But listen to this. This blew my mind. It's a bronze bar. I collect bronze and brass, okay? This is cool stuff. It's heavy. It lasts. But not this bronze bar. They studied this bar. And the, they say that the Imperial Standard Yard Bar, the United States studied it, loses, it shrinks 1.5 millionths of an inch per year. Did you hear that? One, some of you can't understand that, can you? It, I'm talking nothing, all right? One point, not even, uh, friend, a hair is a mile compared to what I just said. <laughs> One point five millionths of an inch, somehow that bar shrinks. It is undetect, you can't detect it, friend. That's silly. But the United States looked at that and said, you know, in a million years, that thing's going to lose an inch, you know? <laughs> I would say, well, get a new bar, you know, down the road, get another bar. No. They say, we're not going to go by that anymore. This blows my mind, friend. I'm going to tell you, in the United States, a yard is a yard. Trust me. <laughs> a meter is a meter. So in 1960, they redefined what a meter was. And they used wavelengths of light from a Krypton 86 source. In 1983, it was again redefined because that wasn't perfect enough. And so they used, it was the length, try to get this now, the length of the path traveled by light in a vacuum One two hundred and ninety nine millionths seven hundred and ninety two thousand four hundred and fifty eighths of a second <laughs> is a meter. That's a meter. Bank on it. I trust him. <laughs> How about weight? Who told you that's an ounce? Who told you that's a pound? Who told you that's a ton? Where did that all come from? Well, it came from a solid cylinder of platinum, iridium, alloy, maintained at constant temperature at a place called Severs, Paris. There's a place there, friend, that's got platinum, and it is an ounce, a pound, and it ain't changing, friend. That's just the way it is. These are standard measurements. I want to lay that foundation. How many understand standards now? Whether you like it or not, our lives are governed by standards. Most of these standards have to do with our physical well-being, something physical. But we're going to get spiritual for the next few minutes. The standards that we have when it comes to spiritual and moral things is a whole different ballgame. I want to ask the question tonight, who or what are you using as a measuring device to see whether or not you are correct in your analysis of yourself? This man has done nothing wrong. That was a powerful standard that that thief said. That means perfect. Nothing wrong means everything right. He's done nothing wrong. He laid the standard. He shot the wavelengths, the light length. He knew exactly what a meter was, exactly what an ounce was. He said, that man right there is perfect. Stay with me just for a few minutes. This will make sense for some of you that flunked your ACT test. <laughs> for the fourth time. There was a time in America where we had strong standards. I've oftentimes brought out into this revival my Webster Dictionary. I have an 1830, 1840 dictionary. It's old, it's brittle, it's thick, and it's full of Scripture. It's awesome. 
I don't know, Brother Hennessy, if you have one, but if you get one from an old bookstore, get the old ones. It's got to be before 1850. And the copies are fine, but it's greater to have an old one, you know, with the leather. Just the old ones that they actually use in the schoolhouse. And you look in that old dictionary under the word sin, and it'll preach to you. It'll put all the scriptures about sin. You look up transgression, it'll put all the scriptures about transgression. You look up the word walk, just the word walk. The new, the new dictionary today will be put one foot in front of the other, you know, walk. The old dictionary says to put one foot in front of the other. Then it says this, to walk in the spirit, to walk after Christ, to walk in the flesh. And it gives you about three or four inches in the dictionary of scripture. Is anyone listening? See, that was the standard back in the old days. The Bible was a standard. If Webster did not put the Bible in the dictionary, people were going to say, well, where did he get that definition? How does he know that that's what it means? That's, this is what it means. According to the Word of God, this is what walk means. Things have changed. Let me share a few things with you. Some of us, number one, note takers, some of us set our standard by looking at others. We look to others as our standard of measurement. That's interesting, friend. You look to others as your standard of measurement. God gave me this this morning, friend. Pay attention. You look to others. This is called the standard. You look to others as your source of measurement, your standard of measurement. The problem is in 2 Corinthians 10, 12, Paul says this, 2 Corinthians 10, 12, for we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. That's not good, friend, to set your standards by somebody that's next to you. You want to know why? You're always lenient on yourself. You'll be sitting here tonight watching this baptismal, and you may be in a backslidden condition. You watch pornography every week. You're a lustful man. As a matter of fact, tonight when people were dancing, singing, I could dance a thousand miles, you were lusting over some woman, sir, dancing in the aisles. But you want to know what happened a few minutes ago? You were watching all these folks talking about their drug addiction and their alcoholism, and you went, boy, ain't that bad. <laughs> there you go again. I'm not that bad. You drive down the road, and you look at some guy buckled over, throwing up on the side of the street or laying in a pool of his own vomit, and you drive by, you go, you feel pretty good about yourself. Comparing yourself with what's your standard, friend? Where are you comparing? I hope you're listening tonight. This is a Friday night message, trust me. Listen up in the overflow and those of you at home. The problem is that many of the ones we're comparing ourselves with have not set themselves up against the right standards. Who are you following? Who are you watching? I preached a message entitled White Cane Religion here, and I talked about that. Everybody is following somebody. Some of you are walking, talking sitcoms. Everywhere you go, you're exactly like the television set. You say the same things, you do the same things. You actually find yourself making some of the same blatant statements that were viewed just a few hours earlier on that 18-inch screen. Shh. Some of you snap at others. You're violent in your behavior, dishonest with your deepest feelings because you've been hanging around others who are the same way. Richard always says, I've heard him say it a hundred times in this revival, you become like the people you hang around. Right. Who is your standard? What is your standard of measurement, friend? Shh. Then I also said this during White Cane Religion that night I preached that. Not only is everybody's following somebody, does the somebody you're following know where they're going? Does your boyfriend know how to get to heaven? Is he going there? He might know how to throw a pass at a football game, but is he going to make it through the goalpost at heaven? Does your psychic have any clue about eternity? Sure, perhaps she can tell you what you ate for dinner last night, but can she tell you about everlasting damnation tomorrow? found a scripture the other day in my Bible. It said, if any man seek a psychic, he's the same person. 
Old things remain the same. Behold, his phone bill becomes new. <laughs> that wasn't in my Bible, critic. <laughs> so there's people sitting going, I can't believe he said that. What an abomination adding to the Word of God. <laughs> You're hard up, I'm telling you, friend. You are hard up. Perhaps your guru can meditate you into a sweet moment of peace on earth, but can he lead you to everlasting peace in heaven? You look inside tonight. We set our standards by others around us. Let me move on. Number two, others of us set our standards by our own conscience. Woo! We've all heard the phrase, let your conscience be your guide. The problem is, who's been teaching your conscience? Where has your conscience been hanging out? Where did your conscience learn right from wrong? I've heard someone say the conscience is a compass of the soul. Friend, your conscience will take you to hell. That's where it'll take your soul. The Bible says in Titus chapter 1, 50, this is good stuff, friend. Pay attention. Titus 1, 15, it says, Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. Yes. This is Bible, friend. As a drug addict, my conscience had been so seared concerning right and wrong that I always did what was right in my own eyes. You ever seen drug addicts talk like this? It's my life, I can do what I want. That's what they do. That's what I did. I ain't hurting nobody, I can do what I want to do. Right in my own eyes. I would go into a store, I would look up, and I'd see all these boxes of cookies. And I go, man, they got 47 boxes of Oreos. 47 packages of Oreos, the, the big stuffed Oreos. I was broke. I wanted Oreos. They had 47 boxes. What would it matter if they gave me a box of Oreos? So I take one and put it under my shirt and walk out the grocery store. That's what my conscience would tell me. It makes no difference, Steve. Matter of fact, somebody's going to drop one of those. I would think like this all the time. Somebody's going to drop one of those packages of Oreos. It's going to fall to the ground. Three are going to break, and they're going to throw it away. They'll never sell those Oreos. They'll be dumped in the back, and they'll sit there for a month, and then they'll be thrown in a dipsy dumpster. Trust me, it happens all the time. Or they'll be donated to the mission. All them broken Oreos and those stale Dolly Madison cupcakes. They're good, though. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> I don't care if it's a day old. What's a day, you know? I remember walking to a store one time, and there was this watch. I'll never forget this. As long as I live, there was this watch sitting there. And it was like a groon or something like that. It was a, or lawn jeans. And, and it was like the price on it was $475. And, uh, and it looked really neat, but it was marked down to $29.95. <laughs> <laughs> How many have seen those watches? Yeah. It's marked down to $29.95. And it was in, a, uh, uh, it was in like JCPenney. And, so, and it was one of those watch sales around Christmas time. It had all these name brands. And I looked at that thing and I picked it up. And I had owned Long Jeans, and I'd owned that brand before I looked at it. And it was a real McCoy. It wasn't a fake. And I asked the lady, I said, I said, this watch right here, man, what's wrong with this? And she said, I said, what's it, $29.95? That's like 97% off. She said, oh, that's last year's model. I went, what? Who cares? I'll take it. So we'll take yesterday's Dolly Madison cupcakes, won't we, friends? It don't matter. I don't know how I got on that, but let's move on. <laughs> I know I was at the Oreo cookies in the grocery store. But I was one of those that Isaiah talked about. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. Everyone doing their own thing. Your conscience is your guide, friend. Careful. Careful. That means 
Every man does what his conscience dictates. You can be in this revival service and you, your conscience can say to you, this is your first night. You've never been in anything like this. There's a lot of emotion here. And he's speaking the truth and he's talking a lot about sin and the danger of it, but you don't have to go down there and respond. This is not you. You're not like this. Your conscience can be speaking to you tonight. How many are listening, friend? Careful what your conscience is saying to you, friend. There's a deeper, deeper voice in this building tonight. A lot deeper than your conscience. It's deeper. Now, your conscience can be good, okay? If it was trained good, my conscience works well now, but I have whipped it into shape, okay? Mine works very well now, and my conscience can be a great guide and lead. It's like the compass of my soul because I feel now when I disobey God, when I do something that I know God is displeased with, I feel it. How many know what I'm talking about? My conscience pricks me, and I get right with God immediately. Mike and I were on a plane. I've shared this often. Mike and I were on an airplane, and I was talking. We were talking about ministries around the world, and a brother's name came up. And I, it didn't take me for about 30 seconds to harm that brother with my words. I said something negative about the man's ministry. I knew the man's ministry. I knew he did not do what he said he had done on foreign soil. And so I, I told all that to Mike, and I tore him down right in front of Mike. And immediately, my conscience drove me up the wall. Immediately, I felt horrible. How many know what I'm talking about? I mean, like a blanket came over me. And I turned to Mike, I said, forgive me, brother. Forgive me for what I just said about this brother. I was wrong. I'm sorry. He said, that's okay, Steve. I said, I mean it, man. Forgive me. I was wrong. My conscience has been trained. Friend, 20 years ago, you think I'd ever done anything like that? I would have said, that guy's a slime bag, always has been a slime bag, always will be a slime bag. <laughs> he graduated from Slime Bag Institute, flunked his ACT test 82 times. My conscience would have never bothered me, friend. Wouldn't think twice. You know what I would do in a service like this if 25 years ago? I wouldn't be in here for sure. You know what I'd be? I'd be outside stealing your car. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing bothered me, friend. I'd hotwire your car and be out of town. And someone comes up and says, don't you understand that that person that owns that car is in a religious service, getting their heart to God and getting blessed by God? And say, I'm getting blessed out here, man. I'm getting their <laughs> automobile. <laughs> Nothing bothered me, friend. I remember one time we used to steal stuff all the time. I mean, we were thieves, nasty thieves, breaking into stores, all kinds of junk. And, and uh, I went up to, I walked by a car, I think it was a Jaguar or something, it was a fancy car. We'd always break into those to see what was inside because people would leave their wallet in the glove compartment. <laughs> Don't ever do that, friend. So we'd break into the car and there was this beautiful alligator briefcase on the, on the, on the, on the seat. And so I got it, ran off, and went about a half a mile away, and it was a, obviously a businessman. Full, the briefcase was full of everything in his life. And I took it all and dumped it all over the valley, man. Just threw everything everywhere. Papers, I'm sure million-dollar deals went all over the place. Because I wanted the briefcase. Did that bother me? Not a bit. I could care less about the man. I wanted the case. I got the case. My conscience was seared. My conscience was seared. Nowadays, if I'm walking along and I look down, I see a piece of paper, I'll pick it up and it says, receipt, and it'll say, Frank Jones. And I'll go, man, I wonder if Frank needs this receipt. <laughs> I'll get my secre secretary spend the whole day trying to find Frank Jones, say, listen, we found a receipt. And he'll go, no, that was just for Krispy Kreme donuts. I really don't need that. Put them on my credit card, but I really don't need the, the receipt, man. Thanks, so. <laughs> Why? My conscience is in a whole different ballpark now, friend. Is anybody listening tonight? <laughs> we set our standards by our own conscience. I tell you, one of the things that'll set your conscience in a heartbeat is good works. People tell me all the time, he's a good man. My husband's a good man. He takes care of the kids. He takes care of the family. He brings home the bacon. I want to know, is he saved? 
because your husband's good works will not save him. I don't care if he was an alkalite in the Lutheran church when he was a kid. It makes no difference, friend, if he's a, a, a master technician and he helps the computers at the church. He makes sure everything runs fine all the time. I want to know, is he saved? One of the things that irritated me most about the church when I got involved in the church was how churches use people. I hated this. And I remember one particular church. There were people that were unsaved in the church. They were heathen in the church. I mean heathen. But they would come to church because they were religious. But they were, they were in sin. And everyone knew they were in sin. But they owned a big company like an excavating company or something like that. And, and when something needed to be done, the pastor would call that person, you know, and everybody would clap and praise him. You know, as he's out there with his bulldozer plowing out the land or something like that. A heathen. You know what that did for him? While he's out there blessing the whole church with his bulldozer, makes him feel pretty good. I'm all right. I've done my, I've done my, I've, I've tipped God. Take two bits, God. Good works. Well, I'm going to tell you, friend, you can go to hell with a soup ladle in your hand dishing out food at the local rescue mission. That ain't going to save you. Your conscience can tell you you're all right, but it won't save you. I ask people all the time about things that they do. You know, things will come up. And one lady the other day said, man, I helped a poor person. I did this. I did." She's telling me about three or four things she, said she did. And they were all fine and good, but they won't save you, friend. Who's your standard? How are you setting your standard? Those of you, you better pay attention on that conscience thing. And the other thing is, number three, Some of us set our standards by the traditions of men. This will preach, friend. You set your standards. You do things the way you do things just because that's the way your father did it. And his father did it and so on. Some of you in this room are so prejudiced. You're so prejudiced it oozes from you. Why? Because your daddy's that way. Why is he that way? Because his daddy was that way. Didn't you know, friend, at the cross, all of that melts? At the cross, all prejudice, all hatred melts at the cross. Where are you setting your standards? The statement that got Stephen killed had to do with this. How many remember Stephen in the Bible? I don't know why my mama named me that. She said, your name's Stephen. He's a martyr. <laughs> why not John? He died of old age, mama. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> your name's Peter. He was hung upside down. <laughs> Crucified. Your name's Stephen. He's the first martyr. He said this in Acts 7.51, he said, Ye stiff-necked, this is what got him killed. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, he was preaching, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. Just like your daddy did, you're doing the same thing. And they rose up and stoned him to death, friend. Some of us set our standards by the traditions of men. Hezekiah in 2 Chronicles says the same thing. Zechariah says, be ye not, Zechariah 1.4, be ye not as your fathers. Don't be like your fathers. What on earth is setting your standard? Just because daddy doesn't like this revival, does that mean you're not going to like this revival? Because your dad or your mom is stale and stuck in religious mud somewhere, you're not going to get out and swim in the clean river? Who is setting the standards in your life, friend? Just because your dad drinks, does that mean you're supposed to drink like father, like son? Or maybe you're supposed to set the standard for the generation to come. come Makes sense to me. Jesus, if you want to read one of his harsh, harsh, harsh sermons, Read Matthew 23, 31 through 39. He said, you are the children of those who killed the prophets. 
you children of murderers. Those of you that think Jesus always preached love, you need to read the word, friend. They hung him on the cross not because they loved him. They hung him because he messed with everybody. No stone unturned. You set your standards by the tradition of men. Well, I'm going to close. You better make sure those traditions are godly. You know, a lot of those traditions may have been okay years ago, but things have changed. God's moving. He's going forward. He's changing things, friend. Move with God. There are some traditions that are solid. They're good. But there's other things that were good for the 60s. But this is the 90s. These are the 90s. I'm with the Assemblies of God. And we used to sing a song with the Christ Ambassadors. It used to be called the CAs, you know, and it went like this. We are Christ Ambassadors. <laughs> How many know that song? Good. <laughs> Wonderful song for the 40s and 50s. You try to get a bunch of young people singing that in 1997, friend, you're hard-pressed. <laughs> Am I telling you the truth, Richard? <laughs> They might sing it if you bring out a guitar and go, bah, we are Christ ambassadors. Bum, bum, bum. <laughs> and that was good for a few years. But come the year 2010, people look at that going, what is bum, 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 bum. What a bunch of trash. And they're in ninth year 2010, they're going, we are Christ ambassadors. <laughs> you don't believe that? Look at the tie you're wearing, friend. You can find it in the thrift store. <laughs> I'm wearing some of the same ties my dad had, friend. I remember. I thought, my Lord, look at that thing. Now we'll pay $39.95 for it, friend. My last point tonight, and I'm closing this Friday night, there is only one standard when it comes to your moral and spiritual life. Paul summed it up like this, for though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, ye have not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Verse 16 of 1 Corinthians 4 says this, wherefore I beseech ye, be ye followers of me. Then he goes on in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, he said, be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. And I'm going to tell you in just a few minutes, friend, we're going to close, but you're going to see a standard that is above all standards. He is the one that the thief looked at and said, that man has done nothing wrong. He is perfect. He is perfect. He is perfect. He is the one that everyone needs to follow. How many have seen one of these little things? WWJD. Can y'all see that in the back? See it up in the balcony? Well, I'm going to help you out. Some of you can't see that, so... so uh, when I first saw this, I thought, man, I need one of these things to just show people. And so a couple weeks ago, I thought, well, we'll go ahead and make one. So, staff, I want you to come out here with that thing. I've made a bigger one. <laughs> so everybody can see it in the overflow room, okay? Everybody up in the balcony can see it. What would Jesus do? Y'all bring it up here. Let me see here. Roll that thing out, Doug. Don't drop it. Keep on going that way, Charlie. Come on. Mike, help him in the middle. Chaplain, help him up. Bring the... Look in there. That way, Doug. Fix the buckle, fix the buckle. But you hold that up. What would Jesus do? WWJD. These are little bracelets that are going around the world at breakneck speed, friend. One day there's going to be a standard. They're going to say it's as fast as the WWJD bracelets went around the world. That's, it's going to be a standard. They're going to go, that's fast. They were made in Michigan at first. Now they're selling millions of these. These are being made and, and they're being made all over the world. What would Jesus do? It came from Sheldon's book, In His Steps. 
in his steps where someone said, what would happen? What would happen if in every decision that we made, we would stop for a minute and ask, what would Jesus do? Which is the way we're supposed to live anyhow. Come down this way a little bit, Doug. What would Jesus do? Let me tell you what he would do. Y'all going to have to, I'm going to work you tonight. Just hold that thing up. Just remember there is only one standard. Concerning holiness, everyone look this way. A few minutes ago I had someone in the back office and we were talking about this right here. Holiness. See, there's not two or three standards to holiness. There's one standard. And as sure as that satellite is picking up that clock in England right now, there is a standard beaming down from heaven. It beamed through Jesus. Jesus beamed it out to everybody else. There's only one standard. That's where this bracelet came from, WWJD. What would Jesus do? What would he do, friend, concerning holiness? For he who do not, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things, yet without sin. He made him who knew no sin, sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Jesus was sinless. Say that with me right now right now. Jesus was sinless. 1 Peter 2, 21 says this, For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. He was sinless. And you know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. 1 John 3, 5. Are you listening? That is the standard. Jesus is the standard, not Joe Blow sitting next to you, not Martha back home. Jesus is the standard. That's why I say in this meeting, if you think you can sit down and watch a 35-inch screen and watch a woman take her clothes off, next time sit down there with Jesus and ask him to, ask, ask him to bless it. It'll never happen, friend. Why? You lowered your standard, friend. You're not looking to the right standard. You know what you're saying? You're saying, well, it's not that bad. Oh, there you go again. That's category one, two, or three, but it sure ain't category number four, which is Jesus. It's not that bad. Oh, honey, this is just a scene. It only lasts a couple minutes, and then the, the movie goes on. Really, the best part of the movie goes on. What would Jesus do? I don't think he would be watching that. I don't think he'd be sipping that liquor. If that liquor is okay, if that social drinking is okay, especially around this holiday season, Thanksgiving, oh, Lord understands, just a couple times a year I drink a little bit. Then why don't you ask Jesus to bless that martini? Why don't you ask Jesus to bless that six-pack of beer? Why don't you ask Jesus to bless that bottle of wine? Why don't people do that in the bars? They're all over the bars tonight. Why don't they stop and pause and ask Jesus to bless the drinks? They know it's wrong. What would Jesus do? Anybody sitting in those bars would say he would never sip this stuff. He would never put this poison in my, their, his lips. I hope this is making sense to you, friend. It's making sense to me. That's in his sinlessness. What about his selflessness, his servanthood? The Son of Man, I'm going to close in just a minute. Matthew 20, 28, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. I've got a dozen scriptures on this, friend, about his servanthood. What are you doing? Jesus came to give, 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 give. How did you come to get, 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 get? You want everything for yourself. Those of you in New Hope Home, I want to tell you how to get blessed. Give yourself away. Jesus spent his life, and I literally mean spent, sold out, giving. He is our example. What would Jesus do? He would give everything. Would Jesus balk tonight about giving a little money and an offering? I don't think so. But some of you sat there, just scrounges. Others of you bless that offering. God bless you. I appreciate you doing that. God bless you. It's helping works around the world. But others here, just so stingy and selfish and going, I can't believe they're even asking for money. Who do they think they are? They're going to ask for money. But you'll go down to Red Lobster. No sweat, man. No sweat. Family of four, $59.95. No sweat. Out to a movie, 
popcorn that's worth about 10 cents, you'll spend $4 on it. No sweat. But boy, don't you talk to me about money in church. You better set yourself a different standard, friend. What would Jesus do? How would he think about it? I'm talking about the standard. There's only one standard of measurement. The reason I turned to Mike and confessed to him that that was sin in that airplane is because Jesus spoke to me. He is the standard. If I had listened to somebody else, they may have said something like, oh, Steve, it ain't no bad. That, that wasn't that bad what you said. That wasn't that bad. You didn't really rip him to shreds. You just said a few bad things about him, but you didn't kill him. You could have said worse. No, friend, my standard is Jesus. Boy, in his, sin, in his sinlessness, friend, in his servanthood, and also in his solitude, there's so much here, friend. I didn't have time today to do everything. You get as much as you can in a day. Those of you that think I need to spend three or four days on every message, we don't have three or four days on every message. I preach a message every day, friend. But Jesus, what did he do with his life? Some of you are so busy all the time. You know what Jesus did? He broke away. He broke away. He got alone. Where's Jesus? He's up on the mountainside praying. The standard. I'm too busy to pray. You're too busy. I don't have time for God. You don't have time not to spend. All you have is a breath in your nostrils, and he gave that to you, friend. That your time belongs to God. What is your standard? Revival will cost me everything. Jesus gave everything. What's your standard? Revival is a lot of hard work. Well, when you compare it to the cross, it's a Sunday school picnic. We live on four hours of sleep, five hours of sleep. Have for two and a half years. I wake up, even when we have a day off, I wake up at three in the morning. Every morning, I'm wide awake. After four hours, five hours sleep, I'm wide awake. Look at these guys, servants. Of course, nobody's going to help Doug with that 80-pound buckle. <laughs> this is genuine plastic. Genuine. What's your standard, friend? Everyone stand. Those of you the chairs, move them to the left and the right. Roll it up. Make sure it's straight up when you roll it. Keep it tight when he's rolling it up. What would Jesus do? There was a lot of scriptures I didn't share tonight, so those of you that think the sermon's too long, you got off easy. I skipped about five pages. But I want everyone to listen. Those of you moving your chairs, just move them quietly and listen. Charity, I want you to come and join me here. Everyone in this room and in the overflow rooms, I'm going to wait till they roll this up. They're fascinated with you guys. Have you ever seen a 30-foot WWJD bracelet rolled up? What would Jesus do? Tonight, those of you that are backslidden in this place, I want everyone to give me your best ear and then we're going to close. You're backslidden in this place. You're doing things that Jesus would never do. Why? Your standards have been too low. When charity begins singing mercy seat, you're going to run to this altar. You're going to run to this altar. You're going to get right with God and you're going to set your watch. You're going to set your watch to the right time, friend. You're going to set it to the satellite. You're going to set it straight into heaven, friend. You're going to set your standard. You're not going to look to the left nor to the right anymore. You're looking to Jesus from now on. He's going to be your standard. 
You're going to come down here and repent of your sins. You're going to get your life cleaned up tonight, friend. I made the statement the other night, one of the statements I hate the most in Christendom that I've heard, and listen up to me, those of you from New Life, from a New Hope Home, is the people that say this. They say, I know I'm not what I should be, but I thank God I'm not what I used to be. Now that's a decent statement, but oftentimes it's a cop-out. What they're saying is a lot of times, and you may, you may have said this and you were sincere and you're really doing great, but a lot of people that make that statement are saying this, I still got a lot of stuff, sin in my life, but I've gotten a lot of sin out. I hated that when I was growing up in Christianity because when I got right with God, I was trained by Wilkerson, Ravenhill, people like that, and they said, get it all out. Get it all out. It doesn't need to take two or three years to get those vices out of your life that foul tongue that you have. It shouldn't take three years to get rid I thank God I know I'm not what I should be. I still cuss a little bit, but I thank God I'm, I don't cuss as much as I used to. Who's your standard? Set yourself up against Jesus tonight, friend. He's your standard. Everyone who's got sin in their life, you're going to come quickly. Those of you that are backslidden, those of you that have never known the Lord, let me tell you, friend, Jesus was perfect. Every other God that everyone else is worshiping falls short. Take it from a thief. That man's done nothing wrong. Isn't that... I personally can't imagine the way people follow cult leaders that are jumping in the sack with everybody's daughter. You read about it all the time. Some cult leader, what's his hang-up? Well, sex, you know, you gotta, he can have sex with any woman in the crowd. You read some of these cults that are going on around America, friend. What a standard, huh? What a standard, what fools following junk like that. Whatever happened to purity, holiness. But Jesus, you look at him, boy, you have to lift your eyes, look up, go, wow, majesty. Holiness. I want to be like you, Jesus. You surpass everyone I've ever met. Even the greatest preachers I've met have their anger times and their, their, their slipping times, but Jesus, you never slipped. You're perfect. You're the one that I want to set myself by. He's the standard. Those of you that have never known the Lord, you come down here and meet Jesus tonight, he'll change your life. He'll become your best friend. You want to know what's great about having Jesus as your best friend? He'll never turn on you. Why? He's got the highest standards. You go to Jesus and say, I got a secret, he'll say, it's a secret with me. Just want to confess this to you, Jesus. Confess away. I tell you what I'll even do when you confess this. I'll go one step further. I'll not only forgive you, I'll forget it. Because I'm perfect. I can do this. Man can't do this. Friend, you need a friend like that. You need a friend like that. The standard. And those of you that are religious in this place, I'm closing with this. Listen up in the cafeteria of the overflow room. You're religious in this place. You do all the right things, but you don't know Jesus. Who's your standard? Is your standard the priest? Is your standard the church ordinances? Is your standard some liturgical work that's in a book that you read? That's your standard? Or is it Jesus? You can go to hell with baptismal waters on your face, friend. You can go to hell with a communion cup in your hand and a wafer in your mouth. If your standards are obeying all the ordinance of the church, you're going to fall short of heaven. You're not going to make it. You set low standards for yourself. Be ye holy as he is holy. Now we're going somewhere. Do you know him? There's your standard right there. Jesus said, if you're lukewarm, I'll spew you out of my mouth. Standard. If you're cold, you're going to hell. Jesus said there's only one temperature, and that's hot. Standard. See, these are indisputable. I just don't believe you need to be fanatical about Jesus like that. Low standard. Low standard. I don't believe you have to clap before the Lord. Low standard. It's in the Word. Clap before the Lord. I don't believe you ought to have all those instruments playing. Low standard. 
who said, well, we've never done it like that before. Wrong standard. What does the Word say? What about miracles, signs, and wonders? I don't believe that stuff. It's in the Word. There's your standard. Right there's your standard. So tonight, friend, who are you setting yourself up against? Tonight, do you wake up in the morning with Jesus on your heart? I'm asking you a question, sir. Do you go to sleep at night with Jesus on your heart? Do you think about him all day long? Or are you one that can leave out of your church service and slap in a country album and a country CD and, and rock and roll all the way home? Before you know it, you've lost every touch of God on your life. You spend more time getting away from God than you ever did getting close to God. Low standards. You're coming to the altar tonight, sir. And the only thing that's going to keep you back is pride. Pride will say, I don't need to go down there. What, you know, what's my boyfriend going to think? What's my girlfriend going to think? What's my husband, my pastor going to think? What are my parishioners going to th think? Who cares? Who cares? Are they your standard? Do you measure yourself? Paul said don't do that. Do you measure yourself with them or do you measure yourself with Jesus? Look up to Jesus and say, standard? I think I've got the wrong time. Give me the right time. Thank you. Jesus? What would you have me to do? I would have you run to the altar and get the sin out. That's your standard tonight, friend. This is clear, crystal clear. Charity's going to sing mercy seat. Everyone who's away from God, friend, and if you don't think you're going to come down here because of pride, you're going to go do it at home. Friend, this is what's going to happen when you get home. If you think you're going to pray at home and not here because you've got sin in your life and you're going to pray at home, the heavens will be brass. Here's why. There's another scripture that says this. If you're ashamed of him, he's ashamed of you. If you'll confess him, he'll confess you. And just try it on for size. Go home and kneel by your little bedside and say, Jesus, I was at the Brownsville Revival two hours ago, and now I need you to forgive me right here in the privacy of my own home. Father's going to look at you and, and say, don't you remember what the preacher said about the crucifixion? He was beaten. He was whipped. He was stripped. He was hung naked on the cross, bloodied for you and you couldn't walk 20 feet for him. Some of you have flown 3,000 miles. Make sure you come the last 60 feet. Everyone standing, if you know there's a sin in your life, if you know you've lowered your standards and you've allowed yourself to slip into things that Jesus wouldn't ever do and you need repentance tonight, you need to get forgiveness, everyone with sin in their life, everyone who's backslidden, everyone who's away from God, hurry. Come on right now. Hurry right now. Hurry right now. Come on. As Charity sings Mercy Seat, turn her on right now. Come on. Hurry. 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 Come on, in the balcony, let's go. In the balcony, let's go. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Come on. Come on. Come on. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Benny, we need you wherever you're at, brother, we need you. Come on, come on, come on. Come on, hurry, hurry. You don't need the music. Get on down here. Come on. Hurry, hurry. Come on. Come on. Come on. God bless you. Come on. Come on. Have the team come up, Lindell. Come on, team. Lendl's going to sing. Lord, have mercy. You need forgiveness right now. You come. Hurry. Right now. Come on. Right now. Hurry. Hurry. Everyone at the altar, stay right where you're at. Come on. Come on. Come on. Y'all help me, okay? For our sin we repent, O oh Lord. They took a dive, okay? Help me. Mercy, now we pray. Come on. And take all our sin away. Yes. Come on. Come on. Have mercy. Come on. How about it, friend? Where have you set your standards? Have you set them low? Have you set them low? Have you set them low? Where have you set them high? Have you set them on Jesus? Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. He is 
to tell you tonight, the devil is not going to... If you'd play softly, Lynn, I'd appreciate it. There's a lot of distractions here. I'm not going to let the devil win in your life tonight, friend. He is the one that pushed your standards down into the dirt. But tonight, you're going to raise those standards. You're going to live a different life from this point on. Your life is going to be changed. Your life is going to be different. Hundreds are already down here. How about you? How about you? I want everybody in this congregation and in overflow to turn to the person next to them and ask them if they need forgiveness, if they need Jesus Christ to forgive them. And when somebody asks you that question, do not lie. And both of you come down together if they say yes. Come on, right now. Do you need forgiveness? Hurry. Hurry. tell you what I feel in my spirit. I'm going to close this. This is what I feel right now. I'm going to close it. But I'm going to give you 30 seconds, Greenwich time, to get down here. And I'm going to close this. People are praying for you. You've got 30 seconds. God bless you, sis. Come on right now. If you're coming, come now. 25 seconds. 25. 24. God bless both of y'all. God bless you, ma'am. 20, 18. God bless you, sis. God bless you, ma'am. 15, hurry, guys. God bless all of you. 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8. God bless you, ma'am. If you're coming, come now. 6, 5. Four, God bless you, sis. Don't wait for your friend. She's got to come on her own. Come on down from the balcony. God bless you. We'll wait on you. Matter of fact, Linda will sing it one more time through. Everyone at the altar, stay where you're at. Come on! There are people here that you've come under conviction over the last two or three weeks or maybe over the last week. God's been dealing with you, but you haven't done anything with it, friend. Quit playing with that and get right with God tonight. In the overflow room, get right with God. Those of you at home, turn your life over to Jesus tonight. He is the standard. He is the standard that we measure all spiritual things by and all moral activity. It's by Jesus. Come on, friend. Come on. Come on. God's been dealing with you. God's been dealing with you, but you still haven't come. Come on. Boy, I wish that, I wish, I wish that preacher would stop, man. Just stop. Friend, the devil would love for me to stop. But your soul is hanging in the balance, and this is Friday night. You ain't going to hit those streets unsaved. Come on down, ma'am. God bless you. Hey, listen. There's people praying for you. I can feel this right now, friend. There's people interceding for you. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Quit fighting.
the altar call, friend, and come down and kneel. Come on. Yes, Lord. Can't believe how much time you spend on this, preacher. Friend, I'd spend all night. This is more important than anything in the world. More important than a good night's sleep. More important than a meal. More important than anything, friend. God bless you. Come on down. Come on. Anybody else? Everyone at this altar, bow your heads right now. Bow your heads. No one looking around. Those of you in the overflow room, bow your heads. And those of you at home, bow your heads. Close your eyes and pray with me right now. And friend, set a standard right now, even in your prayers. Don't mumble. Don't mumble this prayer. Set a standard. Make this prayer count. Let the Lord hear it. Of course, I know if you just set it under your breath, he's going to hear it. But friend, there's something about vocalizing your prayers. I love it when we vocalize our prayers. The devil mm -hmm. hears every word. Mm -hmm. This is Friday night. You're going to slap him in the face with this prayer. Right now, everyone at this altar, pray with me. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus. Thank, you thank you for setting the standard, the standard. 2,000 years ago. 2000. You laid it on the line. You became man. You lived a perfect life. You died a criminal's death. You suffered and died for me. You set the standard. You said it is finished. No other standard would ever be set. From now on, men would look to you as the Savior, the only Savior the standard. the standard. I ask you tonight, ask you tonight to, forgive me. to forgive me. I have sinned. I, have, sinned. I have, hurt have hurt you. I've hurt others, I've hurt others. and I've hurt myself. I've hurt myself. Forgive, me, forgive me, Jesus. Wash me, Jesus. Wash. Cleanse me, Jesus. I repent of my sins. I ask you tonight to be my Savior, my Lord, and my very best friend. From this moment on, I am yours, and you are mine. And my standards from this day forward will be high. I'll keep my eyes on you, for you have your eyes on me. In your precious name, in the name of Jesus, amen. Glory. Everyone at the altar stand. Everyone at the altar stand and face this way. Don't go back to your seats. Look this way. I want you to face me. It's early. Who's coming tonight? Richard's going to come and share a few things with you. I've shared so much on the standard tonight, friend. How many? Does this make sense to everybody? Okay, I hope so, friend, because this is at an eighth grade level, I mean, an eight-year-old eight level. You should be able to understand this. But every one of you at this altar, all you kids, as a matter of fact, all the kids that are 10 and younger, we want to spend a few minutes with you. Come this way right here. Raise your hand, Pastor Van. Y'all go with Pastor Van. Let's give the kids a hand. Come on, kids. All the children. All the children 10 years of age and under that have come forward, you can go with Pastor Van. Every, every, the rest of you, look this way. Look this way. From this moment on, set high standards. Set high standards. When I went through Teen Challenge, which was, was a, drug, a Christian drug rehab program, I noticed that a lot of guys in the programs had very low standards. But it was a Christian program. When I went to Bible school, I noticed that other students had low standards. But it was Bible school. What am I going to do, set my standards with them? No, sir. I set my standards high. And that's when I started getting up at 3 a.m. to pray every single day. 
My standards are high. I found out that later on in the day, everything got too busy. So I got up at three and kept that, kept those hours for 18 years until revival broke out here. Now we're just going to bed at three o'clock in the morning. But before revival broke out here, my wife would tell you I was up at three o'clock every morning, three and four every single morning. Why? That was a standard that the Lord set in my life. And other people would look at you and say, you're crazy. I'd say, no, this is a standard. I'm not saying you have to get up at three. I'm saying you have to get up and pray. Jesus set the standard. He set devotional time. He got away with his father. You've got to do the same. Read the word. Spend time in the Word. Jesus read the sacred scripture. Spend time in the scripture. Spend time in prayer. And please, friend, get the sin out. Quit walking around in the mud. Get the sin out. Destroy the CDs. Destroy the videos. Raise your standards. And when one of your friends says, you want to go to this movie, you look at him in the face and go, no. That's all you have to do. When people come up and say, have you seen this movie? I go, no. You haven't seen it? No, I haven't seen a movie in years. Why not? Well, first of all, I ain't got no time to see no movies. Second of all, most of them are trash. And there ain't hardly a movie at the theater. It might be 95% good, but that 5% nasty, friend, will get in your spirit. And if there's one woman on that film taking her clothes off or even a movie a preliminary movie that they show just bits and pieces that'll be engrafted in your mind forever and you know it sir a month down the road you'll see that picture in your mind and have some lustful thoughts that's why I don't pay any attention to it anymore friend I'm gone it's over my standards are higher and others will come up and say are you holier than me I preached a message one night called holier than thou a lot of people are holier than you friend my family figured that out real quick. When I got super holy, they hated me. But now my family's holy. They've all come to the revival. Now they're all up there, man. They don't do the things that they used to do. Now they understand. Now they, they see God blessing them. My sister just got a brand new, came to the revival, got, got on fire for God, just got a brand new job, thousands of dollars in a raise, just a miracle job. She sees her standards are rising and God's blessing. God is blessing her. Her son witnesses for Jesus everywhere. Where's Jesus' baseball caps? Always talks, where's the WWJD bracelets and T-shirt? Man, this kid's so fanatical, he's going to tattoo it on his forehead. <laughs> What's that? High standards. Does he care if people laughs at him? No, sir. He's got high standards. And if they say, you don't have to be so, so Christ-like, oh, yes, I do. Rich is going to come and share three things with you, and then we're going to pray together. Give him your undivided attention. Before I share those with you, I'd like to ask all the registered pastors and their spouses, if you could help us up here at the altars, we would greatly appreciate it. And if you would, if you would mind, if you go to each of these exits on both sides, there'll be an altar worker there with you that could give you some materials. We'd like to ask all the pastors and their spouses if they just give us about five minutes of their time to help us pray with these up here at the altars. So if you just begin to move to either direction, either one of the exit sides on the side, I'd, we'd greatly appreciate it. Can any of the pastors or their spouses, if you could help us, we'd appreciate it. Those of you at the altar, if you will look at me, in addition to what Steve just mentioned about Bible study and prayer, there's going to be some prayer team members that's going to come and share with you some materials in just a few moments, uh, also dealing with Bible study and prayer. And if you're here tonight and you don't have a Bible, let them know we will get you a Bible, okay? If you're here tonight and you don't own a Bible, let our altar worker know, and we will get you a Bible tonight, all right? But, but in addition to that, listen to me. I want to encourage you with three things. Number one, in addition to those things, I want to encourage you to come to revival as frequently as possible. If you're within a couple of hours of here, we want to encourage you to come regularly. Not because we need a crowd. Obviously, we have more than what we can handle many nights. We have overflow now. Those in the overflow, listen up to me. Um, but listen, this is for your good. As Steve mentioned a while ago, I constantly tell my young people, you become like that which you hang around with. And I want to be like Jesus. Amen? And so I want to just hang around Jesus in revival. You know, I, I want to be around a red hot, Young, uh, people for Jesus, amen? And this is what's happening. Uh, you know, many times we come in here, we're, we're tired, we're exhausted. 
Uh, yes, but listen, every night the Holy Spirit ministers to us. I know that while ago, uh, during praise and worship, the Spirit of the Lord just was ministering to me. And you know what's happening in our lives? We, we are experiencing what the Bible says, being changed from glory to glory. See, and as you get in revival, my friend, that's what happens. The Spirit of the Lord it transforms your lives. And listen, if you're not from this area, if you can't come here frequently, look around your area. Revival fires are burning all over the world now. Ask around, but get in revival. Don't miss out on what God is doing in this last day, my friend. Make a point. Make the effort to get in revival services. Number two. You must be committed to a local congregation. And when I say committed, I'm not talking about just joining up the membership. I'm not talking about going to church on Sunday morning. I'm talking about committed to that church. I'm talking about every time that church door is open, you need to be there whenever possible to be there supporting that church. I know that possibly some of you here, you've been hurt in the church in the past, and you go, well, man, I, I, I've been hurt in the church, and, you know, I can serve God at home. Listen, my friend, the devil is a master at dividing and conquering. In fact, I was sharing with a young person a while ago before service, if you want to put out a fire, spread the coals. You spread the coals out from one another, and they'll go dead, my friend. The devil wants to get you off all by yourself, thinking that you can serve God at home and watch the TV evangelist, and he'll feed your soul. Well, he might feed you a little bit, but who's going to come visit you in the hospital whenever you're sick? That TV evangelist is not going to do it, my friend. Who's going to encourage you when you're going through a dry spell? That TV evangelist isn't going to call you up. See, we need one another to encourage one another. Iron sharpens iron, and we grow together. We, we disciple one another. We, we love one another. The church needs you, my friend, and you need the church. And listen, the name of the church or the denominational name above that door is not near as important as what's coming across that pulpit. Listen, you need to be in a church where the preacher will preach the word and not bat an eye. If you go to a church and you can sit in that church week after week and never squirm in your, your pew, I'm telling you right now, you're going to the wrong church. You hear me? If you can go to a church and sit week after week and never be squirm in your pew when, because the preacher's preaching the word, you need to go to another church because, my friend, none of us are that holy. We need, you, need to let a, you need to go to a church where the preacher will preach the word, and when he does, amen him. Say, amen, preacher, go for it. Let them know you're behind them. But listen, get committed to a local church. And number three, we believe in obedience in this revival. We believe that Jesus is looking for obedience. And the very first act of obedience that you need to follow up on after making this act of coming up here is to follow the Lord in water baptism. Water baptism will not get you to heaven, my friend. Only the blood of Jesus and confession of your sins will get you to heaven. But listen, water baptism is what you do because of a commitment that you made to Christ. See, we believe in total submersion because one of the reasons is because of what it's, it's symbolic of. See, whenever they put you underneath the water, as they did earlier tonight, it's symbolic of the fact that you have died to the old man. And then when you come up out of that water, you have come up a new creature in Christ Jesus, according to 2 Corinthians 5, 17. You need, to, you need to publicly declare your faith in Jesus through water baptism. Now, if you're from this area and, and you're receiving the Lord tonight, you're making a commitment to the Lord tonight, and you want to be baptized here, we have baptisms every Friday night. You let the uh, altar worker know, and they'll, they'll help you get signed up. If you're from another area, when you go home, you need to tell your pastor, say, Pastor, I need to be baptized. I want to make a public declaration of my faith in Jesus. Be obedient. Learn obedience. Learn the simple acts of obedience like water baptism. Get in revival, my friend. Be committed to a church. And learn obedience and follow in water baptism. Now, altar workers are coming and also our pastors that is going to help us and their wives. We appreciate so much of them helping us at this time. Our altar workers have a purple badge on. Or most of our pastors have a yellow badge on. They're going to come and they have some materials they want to share with you. I want to ask that please no one go and be seated until someone has prayed with you. And when they come and they ask you what you came forward for, be specific with them, my friend. Let them help you. Let them pray with you. If you're looking for a good church, ask them, and uh, they'll be glad to try to recommend a good church to you, but let them pray with you tonight, okay? If someone's not with you right now, 
If you'll wait just a moment, someone will be with you in just a couple of moments. All those in the congregation, the overflow rooms, if you will, uh, would you just reverently pray for these up here and worship the, the Lord? And we'll be with you in just a moment as we will change the order of the service. We'll pray for everyone that wants to be prayed for tonight. But we want to be sure to pray with these at the altar that have come to make a commitment because every night we have people who are here for the very first time. They're making a commitment to Christ, and we want to be sure to follow up on everyone at these altars. God bless you. We'll be right with you in just a moment. Again, if you're at the altar, wait until someone comes to you, please. assistance of the Korean interpreter. The Korean interpreter would assist us at the altar call. Oh. 